right? I got a wife and three kids. I work a nine to five job, maybe even an eight to six job. Let's say I live in New Jersey. I pull 100K a year. I'm floating by, man. How would you say, here's how you could set up a plan to be able to make yourself successful while still keeping that job and keeping the same level you are right now to be able to follow in the path of someone making 500 grand a year? People get put into a position where they think that the only way to make more money is to cut expenses. So they cut Netflix, they cut dry cleaning, they cut expensive food, they cut going out to eat, they cut coffee, and cutting expenses but you know the personal finance experts don't really tell people another solution, which is Jared Dillian, welcome back to the New York area. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> How often do you get back up here these days? Uh, about five or six times a year. And you, you DJ too, so you yeah. usually like working around some event in the city yep, at yep. one. Where, where do you usually do it? Uh, it's called Do Supper Club, which is in Flatiron. Uh, I think it's 26 and 6 or something like that. Good spot. Yep. Yeah. It's right by where the path train gets off around here. So you're coming back. I think you were telling me you're doing something in June. Is yeah, it going to be the there? Plan. Yep, yep. Oh, it's going to be cool. there. And you're coming. Yeah, I got I to gotta come to that. <laughs> and you got to bring like... 20 people and 15 of them have to be girls. I so. agree. I like where your head's at. I hope your wife doesn't listen to this, but I'm in. But this is a bit of a full circle moment for me because a lot of people have asked about in, in the past, like what I did before I did this. And I talk about I worked on Wall Street in the private bank. But you were a guy who, from a behavioral finance perspective, was one of the best I've ever seen. And you're somebody whose newsletter I subscribed to religiously, the Daily Dirt Nap, while I was on Wall Street because you had a way of looking at things – like I don't want to oversimplify it, but you would take the macro and make it micro for everyone, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I really, really appreciated that. But the original way I was turned on to you was a professor of mine in college assigned your book, Street Freak, which I think you wrote in 2012? 2011. 2011. He assigned that, I think that was my senior year of college in a class like on Wall Street operations or something like that. And it's your memoir of working not only on Wall Street as a trader during the last hurrah of the heyday of, of day trading, I guess you could say, but also inside of Lehman Brothers, which for people out there who don't remember, that was the main bank after Bear Stearns in February 08 when we had the actual crash in September 08. Yep. Lehman is one of the big five banks that failed, that the government also didn't rescue, and that then crashed the economy. That had to be a, an absolute wild time. Uh, you're talking about the bankruptcy being oh, wild? yeah. Yeah. So I remember, um, I mean, it was kind of an open secret that Lehman was going bankrupt. I actually started looking for jobs in the summer. The bankruptcy was on se September 15th, but I started looking for other jobs. Um, what I do mean, you mean it was an open secret? Like our clients, our hedge fund clients were telling us that we were going to zero, that we were going to go bankrupt. Wow. Um, I mean, but they they wouldn't short our stock at Lehman. They would short our stock at other banks, like at Morgan Stanley, and we would hear about it. Everybody was short Lehman. Everybody was massively short Lehman. So, um, like I said, I knew it was going to happen, and then I decided I was going to pursue the newsletter route. So um, when Lehman went bankrupt, like from a personal standpoint, if you remember from the book, like I was actually happy because mm. I was free. You know, I could walk away. Well, you've been um, writing it for a while on Wall Street. Yeah, right? I was writing like Bloomberg messages. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, hey guys, a lot of you have been asking me where we've been posting our shorts. They are on our other YouTube channels. So you can get them on at Julian Dory Clips. Also, Best of JDP, we're going to start posting there again. And our new one, Julian Dory Daily. For now, we're not posting on the main channel with shorts, but that could be happening again soon. On another note though, if you have not subscribed to this channel, please do that. It is a huge help. 60.3% of you who watched in the month of January were not subscribed. So if we could improve that number with more people hitting the red button, YouTube will put our videos into the algorithm, which will allow us to continue to get great guests like this. So thank you to all of you who have already hit the button. And to the rest of you, please hit it right now. Thank you. Where, how, did, how did you even end up on Wall Street? You were in the Coast Guard for a long time, right? What, what year did you arrive? Like during the tech bubble? So I graduated from high school. I went to the Coast Guard Academy, which is a service academy just like Navy and Air Force and Army, but it's smaller. 
uh, graduated in 96. I majored in math and computer science. And then I went to sea. Uh, I was on a Coast Guard cutter out of Washington State, and I did that for two years. And then I went to Pack Area, which was in Alameda, California, in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I did Intel for three years. And while I was there, I was getting my MBA part-time at University Whoa. of San Francisco. Also, while I was there, I got a job on the Pecoast Options Exchange as a clerk. I worked for this market-making firm. Um, and you know, I basically got sandwiches and stuff like that, but learned about options. That was my first job on wall street. Um, and I interviewed at a bunch of banks and Lehman hired me. So was, were you the guy who there was a dude on the floor that you called meat? Was that in your book? Or was yeah, that, that, that was, and that was, uh, uh, the Chicago mercantile exchange. Mm. So I was trading futures at Lehman. I was trading S and P, NASDAQ, mid cap, Russell, and he was my clerk on the floor, and I called him meat. So. <laughs> we had we had a I guy. actually just talked to him like last week. Oh, he's we still, still around keep and in kicking. touch. Yeah, love that. We we had a guy in our crew in college named Meat. So I remember there was I, I couldn't remember if it was yours or maybe Flash Boys from Michael Lewis, but I guess it was yours where there was a guy named me. I'm like, dude, you're in this book. You're on the you're on the <laughs> stock exchange. I could never see him on the stock exchange though. Some about somebody named Meat on the stock exchange didn't sit right. But you were you were down there, I guess, for the last days at first of when, you know, the spear leads and Kellogg's were around with guys waving their hands, offering yeah, up yeah, prices yeah. and open, stuff. So open before outcry. It's, yeah, before open, it's fully digitized. Yeah, open outcry. So I got there, I started working on the P Coast in November of ninety nine. Um and stocks still traded in fractions back then. Mm. That's how old I am. Like I actually remember <laughs> stocks trading in fractions. So it was like three and five eighths and two and seven yeah. sixteenths and stuff like that. So um, decimalization happened a couple years, happened in 2002, I think. Um, but, you know, there were thousands of people employed at, on open outcry exchanges in the country. So there was the Picos, there was the Amex, there was the Philly, uh, there was uh, the SIBO, plus the futures exchanges. You had uh, the NIBOT and the CME and the Board of Trade. Like we're talking like tens of thousands of people that traded with paper tickets and stood on a trading floor and spit all over each other's necks and <laughs> farted in the pit. And like, like that was, that was a job for a lot of people. And then, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, stuff started to trade electronic and within five or 10 years, gone. it was all gone. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking right before camera that when Spear Leeds sold. I guess it was like oh two or oh one. It was like the top ticker. They sold to Goldman for like six billion. They would have been worth six dollars like five years later. Yeah, it's crazy how fast that happened. But this is also I didn't realize how much until I read Flash Boys how much high frequency trading was already starting to become a thing in say like oh four oh five. I guess I always thought of it like post crisis that stuff started to come in. But guys were building fiber optic cabling just to trade you know, three nanoseconds faster in 05, 06 and stuff. And all the while, you now had a role at Lehman where, I mean, maybe if you wouldn't mind describing it, where you're just trading all day and, and with proprietary money for one of Lehman's, like, arms. Basically, I did two things, right? I was a block trader of ETFs. So I would... I would accept block orders from customers. So let's say 250,000 shares of XLE. They would trade that in a block. And my job would be to hedge that risk and keep a small profit. So that's that's what I did. I was running ETF trading. That's what I did. The other thing that I did was I did proprietary trading. Um, I had sort of a back book where I didn't ask permission to do this, but I started trading macro. I started trading all different kinds of stuff. I was using about 250 million in capital and I made money over time. <laughs> like I, I was pretty profitable. So how many guys were on the floor with you by the time it was over? I mean, there was, so the Lehman building was 745 7th Avenue, which is on the North side of Times Square. It's the Barclays building now. And, uh, the, the building is a little wider at the bottom. And the second, third, and fourth floor are all trading floors. Mm. And the equities floor, the stocks floor, was on the second floor. 
and there was probably 300 people on that floor. I my guess. No, so. was was the setup? Because um, I'm trying to think if it was more old school versus what it what things ended up moving to. Are you like at a cubicle with a Bloomberg terminal, or is it like open floor plan? Everyone screaming at each other, kind of like they used to do open, on the stock exchange. O- open floor plan. Everybody screaming at each other. <laughs> yeah. And actually, one of the things that Lehman did was they made a rule where you couldn't have two sets of monitors. You couldn't have like an upper level of monitors oh. because then you couldn't see across the floor. So they wanted everybody to be able to communicate. So you could only have one row of monitors at Lehman. Whoa. So. Yeah. One of the quotes you had in your book, I hope I don't mess up the number, but I think it was something like you said there were approximately 20,000 people that worked at Lehman Brothers and 19,970 of them or 19,995 of them were really good at their jobs and tried hard. <laughs> I've quoted that a lot on here, and I always just correct it and say it was probably 970, not 95. But either way, yeah. it goes to show you the company that crashed the whole world, you know, we make this mistake on Main Street where we think of Wall Street as this monolith. But when you say Wall Street, it can mean 100 million f-ing things. And you had one area of the bank that was, and I'll let you explain and refresh people what that was, but there was there was proprietary trading derivatives that should have never been allowed to be traded, and they crashed everyone else. And I guess you knew a couple months ahead of time, but, you know, no one at the bank, like, you're not sitting at your seat in 06 seeing this coming in your seat. That's, that's, that's not what you did. Well, in Lehman's case, it, it actually wasn't really prop trading that did it in. It wasn't really derivatives. It was real estate. Re- mm-hmm. Lehman Brothers had a real estate division that was, let me just put this in perspective. At the bankruptcy, Lehman had $40 billion in physical real estate, buildings and land and stuff like that. The bank with the next most real estate was Morgan Stanley and they had $2 billion, right? So basically, <laughs> Lehman had this guy, his name was Mark Walsh, mm-hmm. and he was running the real estate division and they just bought everything. <laughs> they bought desert, they bought condos, they bought stuff in Scotland, they bought they bought stuff all over the world and they never even visited the properties. They just they would just run the numbers in Excel and just say, "Okay, wave it in." I didn't realize it was that much of a spread between them and the next bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, one of the reasons why Lehman was not rescued was because their assets were very illiquid, right? And that's why the bankruptcy took so long. The bankruptcy t- process took like 15 years. It took 15 years just to sell off all those li- un- illiquid <laughs> assets. You know, it would have been, I actually, uh, there's been a lot of debate about whether Lehman should have been rescued or not. And I don't think it should have. I absolutely don't think it should have. I mean, like it, it, the, the cost to taxpayers would have been enormous. So, Yeah, and that's that gets into the the phrase that became famous during that era, the too big to fail. Yeah. And I guess P- I, I, I always kind of wondered how fast that decision got made. I mean, this was one weekend in September, essentially when it all crashed, but how fast the decision was, we're going to let Lehman go and we're, we are going to commit to saving all the other ones. Because when you look at it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I guess, different perspectives from people who were in the room during that time, be it from government, be it from some of the bank, saying that, oh, they were always going to let Goldman be safe. But I wonder if there was a point where they're looking at this like, okay, maybe these other banks don't have $40 million in real estate in this case, but they got $40 billion. They got $30 billion in you know, this fucked up derivative or something, and you know, maybe we got to let them all go. Um, there was also some other factors. Um, you know, Dick Fold, the CEO, was disliked. Of Lehman. Uh, yeah, he yeah. was disliked by all the other Wall Street CEOs. Um, and there was... Unfortunate the, name, too. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the hedge fund uh, long-term capital management? Do you remember that? No. All right, so that failed in 1998. It was a big hedge fund. It failed in 1998. It had some pretty big effects on the market. And it was a private sector bailout. It got bailed out, but it was basically all the banks on Wall Street chipped in a few billion to bail out this hedge fund that was like posing systemic risks. Mm. Well, Dick Fall didn't chip in. He's like, screw it. I'm like, I'm not paying for this. And 10 years later, when he was passing the hat for Lehman to get bailed out, like everybody remembered that. Yeah. Yeah, he was... Who was the other guy? There was a COO too. What was his name again? Greg... 
Well, Joe Gregory. Joe Gregory. Yeah. That's it. So it was yeah. like the two of them had been in charge for a long time at that point, right? Yeah. I mean, they started at Lehman in the 1970s. <laughs> they were commercial paper traders. They were trading short-term rates. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I, I didn't know either of them very well. I met Dick maybe twice. Uh, I was at a charity dinner with Joe Gregory. He sat at my table. I don't really have any strong impressions of him, but they f***ed up big time for sure. How far back did they know that this was a problem? Probably at least a year. And did it, looking at it, looking at the autopsy of it, in that, say, 11 months prior to September 2008, did they try to take any drastic internal actions to turn yeah, that around? Yeah, absolutely they did. So there was um, there were voices at the firm that were telling Dick and Joe as early as 2006 that there was a problem. Mm. Um, there was a guy named Mike Gelband. I forget what he's doing now. But he left the firm. Basically, he was a dissident, and he left the firm. And then when Dick and Joe figured out that there really was a problem, they brought him back in 2008 to try to fix it, but it was too late. Mm. So, If you had found that in – hindsight's 2020 with this. But if you had found that in, say, July, August 2007, and you had, been a, you had had your people in place, been able to take some actions, do you think it would have been salvageable if you took the right actions? As early as a year before? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. How would you salvage $40 billion in real estate that's worth – you would just have to get it off your balance sheet. You'd have to you'd have to sell it at a loss, basically. But um, in two thousand seven, I think that would have been possible. Yeah. But you didn't. You guys only found out that something was wrong when some of the hedge funds trading on Wall Street who weren't making trades with you were going short Lehman. Yeah, I mean there was a you know David Einhorn, uh, yes. who you know who that is. Yep. So he was he was one of the most vocal shorts of Lehman. Um, he, he got into a fight with the CFO, Aaron Callen. Um, so yeah. Yeah. They, I'm trying to think though, if you, if you saw the shorts trades coming in, was there a moment where you or someone else on the floor actually looked at the balance sheet and saw exactly no. what was causing it? Or did you just know like, okay, we have something toxic in here. So I was working in equities. Yeah. Right. So totally different. I, I was not part of any of those decisions. I, nobody knew what was going on. All, all any of us knew was that the stock had AIDS, that it was just going <laughs> down every day. The stock, the stock literally could not buy an uptick for like a year and a half. And so we'd sit there and look at the stock, like what the hell is going mm -hmm. on? You know, but in equities, like we were completely removed. And by the way, you know, Lehman had an equities division, but it was really known as a fixed income firm. You know, so basically, like, the firm was run by the bond guys, and the equities division was kind of an afterthought. Mm. So so you're, you're really not seeing much. But did you – you were looking around for jobs in the summer. Did you think it was going to be like a systemic thing, or did you just think this is going to be where f and everyone else will figure I, it out? You know, I don't think anybody thought that it would be a systemic thing. You know, because when Bear Stearns failed in March of 2008 um, – it, so that wasn't really bailed out per se. It was taken over by J.P. Morgan at like two dollars a share. Yeah. Um, but that didn't really have any systemic effects. And actually, stocks rallied for like three months after the Bear Stearns collapse. So I don't think anybody thought that it would have that kind of systemic effect, but it did. Is there something that you still see today? I mean, we're going to get into some of your behavioral stuff as far as like irrational exuberance and the cycle of people's emotions and how it affects the stock market. Human beings don't change. That always stays the same. But are there things that were brewing in, in hindsight in the buildup to 08 that you see have returned back to that now? No. Um, I, I mean, look, like we, we, we go through these cycles of boom and bust and that's that, like you said, like human behavior never changes, but what was different about the financial crisis was it was grounded in real estate and debt, right? Like, for example, I, I have a quote, okay. And it's kind of a dumb quote, but I'll tell you the quote it's to air is equities to really screw things up takes fixed income. 
<laughs> so, you know, you know what's funny is in 2000, we had the dot-com bubble, right? And the NASDAQ went parabolic. Yeah. It went up to 5,000, and then it went down 80%. We had yes. this crash. We barely had a recession. GDP was down like 0.1%. We barely had a recession off of that. Like, it, so there were no systemic effects from stocks going down 80%. None. Because it's just the people who were over indexed in those stocks yeah. they got hurt. Yeah. But if when you when you when you have debt, right? When you have over leverage in the economy, like that's a completely different issue. So I mean above and beyond Lehman and Bear, like you've seen the big short, I'm sure, right? Oh yeah. Like you, I mean, you're talking about millions of people who are qualifying for mortgages that they couldn't qualify for. There was fraud, like it was rampant in the system, like you know, if if somebody's upside down in a mortgage, that hurts the bank, and you multiply that by fifty million people, and it's just a collapse. You know. So. Yeah, it was it was crazy looking at it now because I got to see the inside of far past that crisis, right? So when I was working on Wall Street, twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen, stuff like that, you know. One of the things we did is we would do mortgages and stuff for clients. We handled everything in their financial life in the, in the private bank. And to get a basic mortgage through, I mean, it was brutal. Every single thing had red tape around it. And, of course, it's frustrating because what happens with a lot of red tape, essentially at some point there's things that would be good for the client to be able to do that now aren't good for the client because that's just how it is. But when when I would talk to guys who had been there – when this all went down and they tell me about, dude, it used to be like three lines, sign it, sign it in the operations part of the office and someone had a house, wouldn't even look at their balance sheet. It's like, well, I now completely understand why that's the case. <laughs> but it's just nuts how that got out of control so fast. I mean, do you think it was looking at the history of it because people were so down on maybe – Stocks after after the dot com boom, you then have a new administration come in. Obviously, you have nine eleven and a whole bunch of things geopolitically happen. But you know, early on in Bush's presidency, he I forget what the name of the act was, but he had like the Every American Gets a Home Act. Is that kind of what drove this towards that attitude? There were a lot of things. I mean, there was a law that was passed in ninety six, and I can't remember the details. Fannie and Freddie played a big mm -hmm. role. Um, also, but also I think the biggest contributor was, was a mistake in monetary policy. Okay. So also remember how I, how I said that everybody thought the dot com crash was going to lead to like this big recession. Yeah. Well, the fed thought that too. So Greenspan lowered interest rates to 1% and left them there for two and a half years. So that's really what kicked off the boom in housing prices. When you can get like 4% mortgages, like everybody flooded in and housing values went up. So I think that's actually the biggest contributing factor. It was a monetary policy mistake. Yeah, and now, I mean, for people trying to buy houses at the moment, we just had, relating to today's times, we just had a really weird three, four years because pandemic hits, interest rates go really low, people buying the shit out of houses for a couple years. And now, over this past year... They spiked interest rates like crazy, and I think in 2023, I'm not going to remember the stat perfectly, but it was like the lowest home purchasing year in years yeah. that we had, strictly because, I mean, we Affor don't- Affordability went down. Yeah, we yeah. don't think about that, you know, on Main Street, right? Yeah. Like me now, I'm, I'm not watching when they're doing the interest rates like I used to, but that affects the entire economy, and it feels like it's in this- it's this pendulum where the people who run the Federal Reserve know that, okay, we're going to – no matter what, we're going to cook it too far one way, one way or the other at some point. There's going to have to be some sort of people lose. We have a recession. Let's manage it, and then we'll cook it the other way, make the same mistake there, and then cook it back and forth over and over again. Like that's a little bit of a – of a what's the term? A little bit of a nonchalant way to look at it, but is that fair to say? Yeah, I would guess so. I mean, it's like the Fed is a much longer discussion. You know, we could we could we could do three hours on the Fed for sure. You know, it's it's Feel free. it's <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's it's nineteen people who have a lot of information and make very terrible decisions for the wrong reasons. You know, why do you say um, that? Um, the Fed is an institution that operates under the, the they pursue the path of least embarrassment. Right. 
if you look at a private company, what is the worst thing for a private company to happen? They lose money, right? Mm -hmm. If a company loses money, that's the worst thing to happen. The Fed is a government central bank. They have a P&L. They make money. They lose money. But they don't care about that. What is the worst thing for the Fed? The worst thing for the Fed is when they're embarrassed, when they make a mistake, right? So everything they do is governed by ass covering, right? Mm -hmm. They are trying to do what looks good in hindsight, right? Which always leads to mistakes. So, Yeah, it's a political game. I joke about it with other things, not necessarily the Fed, but you could say the same thing. People go to get hit numbers on things so that someone looks good on a Tuesday in November at some point every other year or every four years. Yep. You know, so I, I kind of wonder, though, what the what the alternative way to do it would be there, though, because... Would there be a way to do it where you don't know the people on the Fed and so they don't they can't get blowback? You don't find out when they get put on there and, and what they think? I think we this is a radical idea. I don't think we should have a Fed. I don't think we should have a Federal Reserve. Mm. I mean, the most important price in the economy is interest rates. Not the price of eggs, not the price of meat, not the price of cars. The most important price price is the price of money, which is interest rates. Why do we let 19 unelected bureaucrats determine the price of money? Mm. Like when, when the price of everything else in the economy floats freely, why do we decide interest rates by committee? The market knows where interest rates should be more than 19 people do, right? It's millions of people. So just let markets determine interest rates. They would do a better job. And actually, I would argue that the market – does a reasonably good job. The Fed doesn't so much drive monetary policy as much as the market does. Usually interest rates, like long-term interest rates will go up and the Fed will follow. The Fed's not, the Fed usually follows interest rates. They don't even determine it, but they should just get rid of it altogether. So what, but what would, you would just let the free market replace it? Yeah. I'm not a fan of the Fed either. I'm just always curious like what the answer is here. It's kind of like when when you say in politics, well, do you want bigger government or bigger corporations? You have to have one or the other. Like is there – if if the free market were determining – Dude, look, look at what's happening in Argentina with – With uh, Malay? With Malay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he is – he wants to get rid of the central bank. <laughs> like, <laughs> he wants to get rid of everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what's the but, – but how feasible – like is he going to be able to do that? Um, I don't know. I'm long a bunch of stocks, stocks in Argentina. I think he's going to be able to do it. So, but if, if you don't have it, this is the question I always have. If a government doesn't, and I'm not arguing for government here. I'm just saying, like, I don't really know the alternative. If a government doesn't control money, what what do they control? <laughs> I think you arrived at the problem here. Yeah. And how how would you describe that? Well, I mean, that's the most important thing. The Fed chairman, Jay Powell, is more powerful than Joe Biden. Mm, good he, argument there. He sure, is sure. He is like, you know, what's funny is if you ask the average person on the street who the chairman of the Fed is, 99% of them don't know. They know who the president is, mm -hmm. but they don't know who the chairman of the Fed is. The chairman of the Fed in the FOMC have a much better effect on your daily life than Joe Biden does. For sure, right? This inflation that we had in 2021, all caused by the Fed, all caused by the Fed. Is there political pressure to get that, though? I mean, you, you saw it more openly with Trump because he would tweet about it. Yep. But, like, maybe they're not tweeting now, but same deal, like, they're – because they do assign these people, and I guess they can take them out, too. Do they go, hey, you're going to do this because we need this thing taken care of? So Biden has been – very disengaged from monetary policy. First of all, it's not his job. The, the president isn't supposed to dictate monetary policy. Mm. Trump, as you know, was harassing Jay Powell constantly to like have negative interest rates. And if Trump becomes president, the same thing's going to happen again, <laughs> like for sure. So, but Biden, you know, it's, you know, it's the interesting thing is, is that even though inflation was ramping, Biden didn't go to the Fed and say, hey, do something about it. He never did that. Like, I'm sure there were meetings in the White House and stuff like that, but there was nothing public. He never said anything public about the Fed and said, you guys need to do something about inflation. I don't think he understands how the Fed works. I don't think he understands how the economy works. I just, I think he doesn't know.
Yeah, I mean, I always call it the Biden administration. Yeah. Because, like, you know, the lights are on. I don't know how many people are home up there. But you look at what's happened in the world and our roles within it over the past two years since we started to have this, this rapid inflation problem, we've gotten involved in wars. Not boots on the ground, but they've been proxy wars with a lot of money flowing. And when I, when I had Andy Bustamante on the podcast right after the Ukraine war initially broke out... Did you ever have access to, let's say, government secrets that were so big that humanity could never find out about it? Humanity is too big of a word. So I would say I have absolutely had access to secrets that would impact how the American public would respond. What do you mean by that? Meaning I, the roles that I filled, the operations that I participated in, were operations that were relevant and impactful to Americans. They were relevant and impactful to other countries as well, but never humanity as a whole. He actually talked about the strategy, and I'd love to get your thoughts on if this makes sense, but the strategy of when you then create, say, like a client state in Ukraine where you're pumping money into the problem and the war is backed by, quote, U.S. dollars, over the long term, you could be fighting against, you know, the threat to the dollar as the global reserve currency because it's involved in intricate situations of the highest stakes. Yeah, I mean, really what happened was when Russia invaded Ukraine, the Western world put all kinds of sanctions on Russia, and Russia says, fine, like, we don't need the U.S. dollar. And now you've seen, you know, the BRICS basically trying to form a currency alliance to not use the U.S. dollar. Like, this is really, I mean, this has been overdone. Like, you've seen people on Twitter, like, talk about this, like, the dollar is going dis- to, it's, it's not going to disappear. But... For the first time, like people are looking at the U.S. and the U.S. dollar and saying, like, why do we have, why do we, why does everybody U.S. use the U.S. dollar? So, is there a real? I mean, like you said, some people doomsday scenario, like it's happening tomorrow. But is there a threat, a legitimate threat within the next twenty five, thirty years that the U.S. dollar actually isn't the global reserve currency? Uh, the the smartest thing I ever heard about this was, and I don't remember where I heard it, but somebody said that the, U, that the U.S. dollar will no longer be the world's reserve currency when the Navy loses an aircraft carrier. I'm not following. Okay. So how do we project military power across the world? It's through the Navy. Uh-huh. Okay. We have 12 aircraft carriers, I think. An aircraft carrier is very symbolic, Right, it's 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 it, it's a symbol of U.S. military power. If we were to lose an aircraft carrier, like in a war with China or something like that, that would be the beginning of the end of the dollar. If you think about who had the reserve currency before the United States, it was Britain. It was the mm. British pound. Who had the world's biggest navy? The British. Mm. Right. If you look before Britain, who had the world's biggest navy? Spain. Right. Any time that Navy like ceases to become the world's most powerful Navy, like that's when you lose reserve currency status. Now, if it is that simple, playing the hypothetical of that argument, I feel a lot better because I feel like we're pretty far ahead in all that shit. Still, we love war. You know, China. China now has more Navy ships than us. Really? They do. They do. Mm. Yep. Is that like brand new? Uh, within the last five years, I think, yeah. Is there a way we can Google that number of ships, China naval ships versus when I, U.S. When naval I was ships? In the, when I was in the Coast Guard, we had about 600 naval ships. Now I think we have about 300, and I think China has like four or 500. Wait, we cut? We actually cut some money from our government budget? Uh, well, ships got more expensive, and we just didn't replace them fast enough. No so, shit. Yeah. Now how big, dumb question, I should know this, but like... What's the range of the size of those naval car- carriers? Are they all a very similar size or are some way bigger than others? They're all different sizes. Okay. Yeah. And they're just around the world at any given time, be it yep. in ports like policing yep. or in a war zone, stuff like that. Yep. Hmm. And that was what Japan attacked in Pearl Harbor. They were literally attacking yeah. our naval fleet. Yeah. I've never Googled how many ships they took out in that. Do you know that off the top of your head? Uh, I don't. I Can don't. we Google that? Yeah. Because that uh, I would imagine back then we had a lot fewer ships than we do now. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but 
I guess from a strategic standpoint, that was the way to go. But, I mean, you and I were talking about China literally right before we hopped on camera as I was asking your opinion on them long term. And the, the dichotomy I gave you was, for people who obviously didn't see that conversation, the dichotomy I gave you was you kind of have two camps. You have that guy, Peter Zion, who I think you said you know a little bit, who says China's fucked. 10, 15 years from now, they're going to have a giant famine, population collapse, everything's going to shit. And then you kind of have the other camp that's like the Andy Bustamante camp where he speaks on that from, I guess, personal experience in his in his job with the CIA. But he talks about how China's the biggest threat. They're going to overtake us on everything. And I kind of sit in the middle where I'm saying, OK, what if Zion's right? But we have 10 to 15 years on the way there with a murderous, psychotic dictator who's doing all kinds of shit around the world that could cause problems that last far beyond China actually being this power that they are right now. From a market perspective, though, how do you approach China today and what do you think is going to be the the landscape, say, a decade from now? Uh, I can't predict out a decade, but I will tell you that today – the number one question I get in my newsletter from people is, when do we buy China? Because if you look at the chart, it's just going like this, you know, mm. from the upper right to the lower left. And um, my answer is never. We never buy China. Like, it's, it's a damn communist country. Like, there's no property rights. Like, companies exist at the whim of Xi. Executives disappear. Like, the demographics are terrible. Like, Zion is right about that. Um, and I, you know, China has gotten, they used to have like a little over 10,000 economic statistics. They have about <laughs> 1000 left. They've How did they get away of, with this? They got rid of 90% of them. And the ones that are left are fake. Like literally just a couple days ago, they reported 5.2% GDP growth. Do you think China is growing at 5.2%? No. Not only are they, not only are they not growing at 5.2%, they're in depression. Like, they're in actual depression. They do not have positive GDP growth. Do we know that, or are we... Because well, I always wonder about the information we get So, in So some of, the, some of the statistics that we used to look at to sort of verify the data were like electricity usage, right? Mm. If electricity usage was going up, then it meant that it was growing, and if it was going down, it meant that it was shrinking, and now we don't have that anymore. So, we like, we just kind of have to take them at their word, but... You know, with the stock market going down every day, I doubt they're I doubt they're in expansion. So, but anyway, what I was going to say was, I don't think they're going to have a stock market in five years. You don't think they're going to have a stock no, market I mean, at all? She is. He's not. He's a nationalist. He's not a <laughs> capitalist, right? He wasn't like leaders before him, which sought to increase China's economic growth. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. And if the stock market becomes embarrassing, like getting back to the embarrassing discussion, like what's the worst thing for the government or like a dictator is to be embarrassed. If the stock right. market becomes a laughing stock, they'll just either they'll just nationalize everything and the stock market goes to zero. So when they nationalize it, they obviously the government takes possession of it. So that that means that everyone, everything becomes state owned. Everyone in the United States, they, but they don't now it doesn't have any price or anything. It's yep. just literally worth zero. Yep. So even, even say, the Chinese stocks that are underwritten here in the United States through like the New York Stock Exchange or whatever that we buy, like JD.com or something like that, they would be worth yep. in a day nothing. Yep. That's some doomsday shit. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I. It, I'm. It's so. It's not that I'm bearish on China. I'm not shorting China, right? Because I think I think it's kind of a waste of time, but. If you look around the world, like instead of being a degenerate and trying to pick a bottom on something that's like, you know, you're where you're like catching a falling knife, yeah. like buy India, right? Buy Argentina, buy places with good politics where things are growing, where there's good ideas and people are flourishing. Like India has positive demographics. And Modi has been in power for 10 years. What do you mean by positive demographics? Like the population is growing. Yeah. Modi has been in power for 10 years. He's going to be in power for four more years. Like he's done a terrific job with the economy. Look at a chart of India. It's, it's not, it's not doing this. It's, it's, it's doing this. It's going the mm. other way. You know, do you think something like India because of the, I, I forget offhand the size of their population, but it's enormous. 
it's comparable to China. Do you think a country like that could replace China in the world pecking order? Oh, for, for sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because it seems like the China thing's so weird because before June 2022, it was like bizarre. You, they were investing in everything here. And so when you went to talk about it on media, it was like, oh, no, we don't talk about that. I mean, they wouldn't even let it – they weren't, they weren't even letting people call it the Wuhan virus when it literally came from Wuhan. And then something shifted. These think tanks, I think – I want to say the first one was the Hudson Institute. I remember I called my boy Danny Jones from the Danny Jones podcast. It was like June, July, somewhere in there, 2022. And I'm like, dude, all these th like kind of mainstreamy think tanks are now writing open papers about China. You then saw the Five Eyes come out like – and – you know, that that's the English speaking yep. countries, but also like the FBI on an international level come out and make all these hardcore statements about China. I'm like, why is this like now in vogue? And it seems like maybe, you know, I always wonder if like the attention is trying to be driven from something else. Does that mean that something like India growing with, as you say, positive politics or something right now could be viewed by the United States government in some way as a as an emerging threat? Oh, no, India is an ally. Mm. India is an ally. They're also a nuclear power. How many nukes do they have? Oh, I don't know, but... Can we Google that? India nukes? <laughs> <laughs> we always got to pull it up. <laughs> that doesn't... I mean, Russia's got great nukes, but they got the GDP of Italy. All right, 200 nuclear... 164 nuclear weapons and has produced enough weapons-grade plutonium for up to 200 nukes. I mean, that'll do it. <laughs> That's enough to be dangerous. I think we're... What are we at, Alessi? I want to say like either 700 or 1,500. Somewhere in there. USA nukes total. Peak stockpile. <laughs> Our peak stockpile was 32,000 in 1967. Holy shit. Oh, I think he hit it right there. 820. U US. All right, so we're, we're down from 32,000 to 820. God, how do we get that high? Cold War was some yeah. weird shit, man. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Woo. I used to have this picture in the old studio on one of the walls that was Bikini Atoll, that mm -hmm. island in the Pacific that we blew up using for like nuclear testing, and it showed one of the nukes. And then below it, I had a picture of uh, what's it? Michelangelo's The Hand of God and Adam, but instead of Adam or instead of God, it was like a robot. And I always looked at it because like we look at AI and stuff as something this existential threat. And I guess the slight optimistic thinking is we have had this shit for 80 years now. And despite using it twice on Japan to end the war, and despite all the geopolitical conflicts that have happened with countries around the world since then, something about every level of humanity up to and including crazy dictators who have existed has stopped us from using this stuff. And that gives me a shred of hope. Have you seen uh, Oppenheimer? I Dude, I actually still haven't. Yeah, I'm embarrassed. Either. I still haven't it's watched It's actually, it. I wasn't that big of a fan. Really? Yeah. Why? Well, you know, I love Christopher Nolan movies. Uh, I love the geeky sci-fi stuff. I loved Interstellar. I love Inception. Mm. Um, I thought it was going to be a geeky sci-fi movie about nuclear weapons. It's really about politics. It's a political movie. It's about how Robert Oppenheimer was kind of, you know, he... He became a peace advocate, and then he was smeared by the government, and, you know, it's mm. – it's. I don't want to say it was boring because it wasn't boring, but it just wasn't the movie I thought I was going to see, so. Yeah, I mean it's, it's, it's so wild to think that a team of so few people was able to come up with this, and then, I mean, everyone's heard his famous line where he talks – where Oppenheimer talks about it and, it, and it ends with, like, I have become death or whatever. You have – the power in your hand that if you got pissed off enough, mm. you could turn out the lights everywhere. It's a heavy fucking thing, man. Yeah. And then I think about all the dictators who have a button like that and they haven't used it. It's interesting. Yep. You know? What does that say about what we could do to them, though? If they, if they haven't used it all these times, all these different regimes that have existed have never used it. Does that say, like, we're, we just got way better shit that we could just wipe them off the mat if they tried something? Well, I think there's sort of a tacit agreement among governments that if you're going to engage in conflict, you will do it through conventional means because mm. the consequences to a nuclear attack are, you know, just annihilation. 
So like just, you know, if you remember, Putin was threatening to use nuclear weapons uh, on Ukraine. Yes. And he ultimately didn't. If we, if let's say we had, if if we had U.S. troops in Ukraine fighting against the Russians, it would be a conventional war. There would be no nuclear weapons used. Like, I really, I, I really believe that we've just sort of agreed to not use nuclear weapons. So we've so. agreed to send the young sons of every country to front line to shoot at each other and kill each other, and and it's more humane. Yeah, <laughs> and actually. <laughs> They're technically right about yep. that, which is the craziest part. But it's so fascinating how even today with everything we know, all the global interconnectivity, we still have that that war footing process. It's not like, you know, the old days where they'd stand in line and actually just shoot at each other from point blank. It's not that, but it's still like, all right, we're going to send our guys. You're going to send your guys like Cowboys versus Eagles, and we're going to go we're gonna go duke it out, and people are going to die. I, I still – there's something about – humans that blows my mind that we still do that it's crazy but i mentioned early on your calling card to me at least is that you're this behavioral finance guru and so for people who aren't as familiar with that term out there essentially you can look at what we everyday humans do and take patternistic behaviors in a way and apply that to what you think the market's going to do. You gave one example that's more technical where you talked about like, oh, if they're not using as much electricity, that tells you there's not as much going on and maybe you sell. But my favorite theory you ever gave that kind of encapsulates what what you're about is that seafood tower theory. And we've talked about that on multiple podcasts throughout the history of this podcast. But I remember you wrote about that in the Daily Dirt Nap, Daily Dirt Nap maybe six, seven years ago. I never forgot it because you said if you live in New York – and rule of thumb, you go to like a decent restaurant and suddenly you start seeing seafood towers everywhere. These big, <laughs> gluttonous, huge $500, $600 things where the seafood on there actually costs about $60. It's just a show yep. of wealth. You're like, sell everything because people are <laughs> rationally like exuberant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when did you really get into the – the behavior to, to drive your trading decisions. So you've heard of Daniel Kahneman? Yes, of course. Okay, thinking fast and slow. Yes. Okay. Um, I was reading Daniel Kahneman stuff way before he became famous. Mm. Okay. 2003, 2004, I was going on Amazon and buying books of his academic papers with Amos Tversky, and I was reading his academic journals about behavioral finance Whoa. Um, because here's my theory on this. This is very important. Fundamental analysis is when you look at balance sheets and income statements for companies and you try to figure out which ones are cheap and which ones are expensive. Okay. Technical analysis is when you look at charts, you say there's a trend line here and there's support here and there's resistance here. Okay. Both of those two things don't work. People do them all the time, but they don't work. If you, it, fundamental analysis, if you're looking at balance sheets and income statements, you're looking, you're looking at the past, right? And it's all publicly available data that every, all the, all the, everybody's looking at the same stuff, right? So nobody has an edge there. And the charts, everybody's looking at the same charts. Nobody has an edge. But with sentiment, I actually call it sentiment these days. But with sentiment trading, like – Human behavior is constant over time, and it forms repeatable patterns, okay? And that's where the edge comes from. A lot of people have come around to my point of view in the last 10 years. There are hedge funds that employ strategies on sentiment. Uh, they usually do it quantitatively. I do it qualitatively. How, like, how would you describe that difference? So um, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, okay, like in finance Twitter, and I look for, I look for words, right? If somebody tell, if somebody tweets that a stock is unstoppable, <laughs> that that gets my attention. If somebody tweets that a stock is relentless, that gets my attention, right? Because when people start extrapolating the present out into the future, like what, like like the Bitcoin people when they say, okay, Bitcoin's a forty thousand, it's going to go to two hundred and fifty thousand. It's an extrapolation of trend, right? And when people start ex 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 
extrapolating the present into the future, it's an expression of confidence. Yes. It's a, it, it means that people are confident that what's happening now is what's going to happen three years from now, right? And that's usually the time to sell, usually the time to sell. And why is that? Um, typically, it means that everyone who could be invested already is invested and there's nobody left to buy. Everybody's already everybody's already long. So because too many people are saying yeah, I always try to picture this. It's too many people are saying it. So the it's like it's like a Ponzi scheme idea like once there's once there's too many people on the boat, the boat just sinks. Nobody it's left it, to buy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they can't get it. Yeah, I mean I guess from so when you say that the the hedge funds are going more quantitative are are you literally talking about like some of the stuff you mentioned earlier with the electricity and things like that, where they just look at what things are trading to be able to say they've, what they've, the macro is? They've set up algorithms to scrape Twitter and oh. look for those kinds of signals in people's tweets. Like for sure that's happening, you know, or, yeah. or news articles or press releases from companies. That's another one. Like they'll, they'll program a computer to do like natural language processing to analyze a press release from a company and look for certain words. Mm. Well, it, I mean, timing is critical to this stuff too, and no one can time the market, but like, you can time the market. You can. Yeah, absolutely. I do it all the time. That's that's kind of what I do for a living. Yeah, but when I say time, I mean call it on the tick. That's what I mean. Call it on, you know, March 9th, 2009. Oh, here's the bottom like that guy did on CNBC, which was amazing, right? Like you may call it on February 1st and lose money till March 9th and then boom, we saw it in the it's big hard, short. It's, it's hard to get it exactly right. Yes. And in the big short, all those guys were early. They were yes. super early. Yes. Yeah. Michael Burry, I think, lost money. Yep. Like, hand over fist for two and a half years spotting this stuff and barely made it. And then once he made it, obviously, it, it exploded. But- you know, getting in there right when it is can sometimes cost you. I, I remember because I was still on Wall Street at the beginning of the pandemic. I was hanging on the last thread. And in in April 2020, the irrational exuberance of people day trading at home was so fucking crazy. I remember getting texts from people, no offense, like some of the people who were not too bright in my phone saying, hey, what's your opinion on this stock or whatever? I just opened up a Robinhood account. <laughs> and I remember calling my boss like, oh, my God, we got to sell everything. Like, this is <laughs> fucking crazy. But it lasted another 14, 16 months after yeah. that. How does that happen? When, when, like in that situation, you had everyone at home. They were all doing the same shit those first couple months. How did something like that last? Was that just because they made interest rates so easy and they're like they, – they artificially prolonged it? Is that it? That's part of it. Um, calling bottoms is a lot easier than calling tops in stocks. Mm. In, in stocks. Um, stock markets will bottom in a moment. You usually get V bottoms in stocks. But you get U tops, mm. right? So, it, it, like, if you're trying to call a top in the stock market, there's a period of time that's called distribution, okay? And distribution means that stocks are going from strong hands to weak hands, okay? And that process takes time. Like, it's you never see a V top in the stock market. It's always a big rounded top. Mm. So it just like if you're if you're trying to short the market, it just takes a lot of patience and risk management. And basically, you know, staying put until the crash. So. Well, well, do you think people being forced home during the pandemic and getting more connected on social movements that even affected the stock market changes how we look at behavioral finance? I mean, to put a perfect example on it, look at how long GameStop lasted with that whole thing. It was, it was objectively not worth anything, but people just got behind it and enough – it was like, oh – you don't want to have paper hands that get off. Enough people stayed on. You know, it's funny. I, we talked about Ben Mesrick before. Yes. And uh, I met him out, out in Vegas. And in his presentation, he talked about the fact that people really weren't buying GameStop to make money. Like, they weren't, they weren't trying to buy it 100 to sell it 150 They weren't trying to make money. It was a fuck you to the system. It yes. was a fuck you to the banks. They didn't care. They were just trying to blow everything up. 
So that phenomenon that we experienced with the meme stocks, like it, we've like we never seen that before in finance. Like it's never happened before, and it really happened because people's concept of profit and loss and gain and loss, like it just it it, it just became divorced from reality. You know, like why else would you buy GameStop at five hundred dollars a share? It's crazy. Like, like people were not trying to make money. Yeah, they, I I remember talking to some people off the ledge during that time. They're like, "I'm this is a this is about the principle. I'm gonna I'm <laughs> gonna take out a loan against this because we have to win." I'm like, "You're not gonna win. <laughs> it's a giant club. You're not in it." But it's amazing that and then, all these and then years Robin like, Hood got rid of the buy button. Yes, yes. I mean, but still, you have stocks like AMC today that still have memers in it. I haven't checked in the last few months, so maybe I'm wrong it's now. Below, I think it's like below a dollar. Okay, so yeah. it's crashed now, but that lasted for a while because yeah. you had memers in it for, I guess, like a couple years even there at some point, which just totally changes. You know, like if you were going short AMC in February 2021, you probably lost too much money and not close your position, which guys in GameStop, some major hedge funders actually had that happen where they it got – like they were right. But it didn't matter. Yep. And then they got caught with their pants down, and they had to close out their shorts because they're over leveraged on everything. It's it a, it a wild time. But I mean, do you do you get? I remember when when Portnoy was doing. I was telling you this before, but I remember when Portnoy was first doing that Davy Day Trader thing, <laughs> and you were like, "Oh my God, this is." It was in that spring, twenty twenty. You're like, "This is a top," and you couldn't stand this. Do Do you think that that's bad for the markets when shit like this happens? That it's pop culturally fun. I think it's I think it's bad for average people. I think it's bad for individual investors. Um, if you're taking advice from people who are not serious, you know what I mean. Like, um, Davy Day Trader lost a lot of money for a lot of people ultimately in the end. Um, and the architects of the whole GameStop stuff, they lost a lot of money for a lot of people. Um, I just like I wish that. People would listen to, you know, it, there's, I have a whole bunch to say about this. It's crazy. Like, say it. Now's the time. <laughs> I, look at me, right? I'm wearing a t-shirt and I got tattoos and whatever. And like people will listen to somebody in a suit on CNBC. Got a suit, got a tie, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're in front of their wine fridge or they're wearing a fleece vest or something like that. And they're like, oh, this must be like a serious guy. Like how, how does an average person tell who is knowledgeable and who has good advice in the markets? It's not necessarily the guy in the suit. It's not necessarily Dave Portnoy with the green hammer. Like who is it? You know, who has the answer? Yeah, I mean – you even see that though. You'll see like the famous videos of guys on CNBC in that sweater vest and everything, and then suddenly they get caught with their pants down, not knowing shit about the stock they're talking about. <laughs> and and my question is, I'm almost like, how is this not illegal when they do that? Like at least Dave, like listen, dude, if you think that was like deadly serious, then you're kind of dumb because, like, it's Dave Portnoy. He's having a good time. But when you get these serious people who go on these channels and just say this shit over and over again and maybe don't always tell you exactly where they are in their portfolio at that time, I know the hosts always have to do that. But, you know, I, I wonder, like, okay, there's guys getting thrown in prison for insider trading. Like, what is this shit? Like, isn't that, isn't that muddy water at best? I, I think about the ethics of what Dave Portnoy does. Right, because he'll buy a hundred thousand shares of a stock, and then he'll tweet about it, and all these monkeys will yeah. buy the stock in it, you know. And he's—I don't know if he's selling to them, but he could. <laughs> he could, you know. There actually was um, the SEC went after some guys on Twitter, and I do not remember the details of this, um, but they were they were doing pump and dump on Twitter. They had they all had big followings. They had like oh, eighty yeah. ninety thousand followers. And they were mostly doing it in small cap stocks where they weren't that liquid, but they would accumulate a position in a small cap stock and then they would tweet about it and get everybody to run it up and they're selling it to them. And those guys are, they'll go to jail. Yeah, like, that's, so. that, that's prison. Yeah. That's so obvious. That's like, that's literally what Jordan Belfort did. You know, like that was the boiler room stuff. Oh, you got something, Les? Yeah, this is it, I think. 
The U.S. government charges eight social media influencers over alleged pump and dump scheme. This is from December 2022. All right, go down. The Securities and Exchange Commission has charged seven Twitter users and a podcaster in an alleged $100 million stock manipulation scheme run through social media, the agency said. According to the SEC, the seven Twitter users also used the messaging app Discord to promote certain stocks to hundreds of thousands of followers and then quietly sold their positions after a run-up. In the stock price, yeah, that's so textbook. And they got, they even were texting about it. I'm like, yeah, they can't pull that in Discovery. Christ. The podcaster named in the case allegedly also engaged in the illicit trading scheme and promoted the other defendants as expert traders, according to the SEC. Our Discord and Patreon links are in the description. We are starting to do AMAs on Discord. And we are also now releasing a new show called The Julian and Alessi Show with my producer, Alessi Aleman, on Patreon, along with some other exclusive content from episodes that we have been putting out on YouTube that are not seen on YouTube. Well, I mean, the 500 pound elephant in the room here is crypto. Right? I mean, we just saw that whole thing. And I enjoy your, as someone who likes some of the ideas that are supposed to be at the forefront about aspects of crypto, I enjoy your contrarian opinions on a lot of stuff. You've also been dangerously close to calling tops and bottoms on tickers on Bitcoin. Got to give you credit for that. But, you know, you're somebody who just said 20, 30 minutes ago, you'd like to get rid of the Fed, which is right in line with what a lot of people in crypto say. So why don't why do you think something like crypto doesn't work? Um, I think it could work. I think it could work, but it's um, I mean, look, like a lot of people say Bitcoin. There's 21 billion bitcoins, and there can never be any more. And this is this is money. It's like gold or whatever. Um, yeah, I I, I, su- I suppose it's possible that. You know, in 2054, we could all be using Bitcoin and maybe we don't even have phones then. Maybe in 30 years we We have something else, you know. So so that's possible. But one of the reasons I don't really like crypto, and I've traded it some, is um, the volatility. Like I just – like I'm a more conservative investor. Um, Anything that has a lot of returns also has a lot of risk, Okay. Bitcoin has great returns. It has a huge amount of risk. Uh, it can move around 8, 5, 10, 15 percent a day, right? Um, I this gets into my book. I didn't. I, you were going to bring that oh, up later. Oh yeah, yeah, but, yeah. By the way, for people just right now, because we're going to be talking about this, your new book is now out. No, when this comes out, we're yep. recording this a couple weeks ahead. No worries. I've already looked through some of it. This goes through like this is a personal finance handbook. From and I give a huge endorsement to Jared. He knows his shit inside and out. So we're going to be talking about this within the conversation. But go ahead. Yeah. So um, if you like, let's say you bought Bitcoin at ten thousand, and it goes to a hundred thousand, it goes to twenty thousand, it goes to two hundred thousand, it goes to forty thousand, it goes to five hundred thousand, it goes to eighty thousand. You're experiencing these big swings. Yes. It causes you stress. It causes yeah. you stress. The returns are great. The risk is terrible. So one of the things I talk about in this book is how to construct a portfolio in such a way that minimizes your stress where you don't trade off much in the way of returns, right? So leave Bitcoin aside for a second. Let's talk about stocks. Stocks return about 9% a year. They have for the last 100 years. They return about 9% a year. I have something in here called the awesome portfolio, which returns 8% a year but it has half the risk of an yeah. 80-20 portfolio. And also, you know, stock the stock market can go down, can go down 50%. The most that the awesome portfolio has ever gone down in a year is 12%. 12%. So How if, many years did you stretch that? Back to 1971. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Wow, and what's that what does that consist of? So it's 20% stocks, 20% bonds, 20% gold, 20% cash, 20% real estate. Simple. I like yeah. that. Yeah, and you rebalance it every year. Whoa. And how much do you practice that yourself? Is that about Loosely, where your percentages yeah. are? Yeah. How long have you been doing that? Uh, since 2005. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it, basically you're, you're giving up a little bit of returns, but you're massively reducing your risk. And the goal here is is you don't want to be checking your phone every five minutes yes. to see where your stocks are, where your crypto is. 
like you shouldn't think about your money. You should not think about it at all. Like one of the things I miss about mutual funds, you know, 40 act mutual funds is that they don't trade on an exchange. You get the NAV once per day. Yep. And you don't even know where it is until you get a quarterly statement. You get a quarterly statement in the mail and you say, oh, I made money or I lost money. But you don't think about it. That's the way to do it. You want to construct a portfolio in such a way. Set it and forget it. Just set it and forget it. Now, are, but do you, do you think that there's been an overemphasis within our markets on passive trading? Meaning like – we have so many goddamn ETFs now that are just diversified giant instruments that there's been talk that maybe Jack Bogle, the famous Vanguard founder, his his theory on that is going to blow up on itself because that's all people are doing. They're just buying broad shit. So in 1997, passive investments made up 1% of the market. Today, they make up 56% of the market. That's almost lower than I thought it would have been. 56%. Okay. In Japan, it's 70%. Japan is 70%. Wow. Um uh, passive could go to 90% and it's not going to blow up. It's not going to blow up. But if you think about what passive investing does, if you, if you invest in an index fund, you are, you're a parasite, you're a free rider. And what you're doing is you're relying on active investors to buy and sell things and drive prices to their yes. equilibrium levels. And you're piggybacking off of their efforts right? So the fewer people you have that are buying and selling in order to get stock prices back to equilibrium, the more inefficient the market becomes and the more inefficient the passive investors become. So let's say we got to a point where we were 90% passive and you had 10% of active investors. Like the market would be incredibly inefficient, but there would be nothing you could do about it because 90% of people are just on pure beta riding the market up and down. So, yeah, and and I think a lot of people like when they buy this stuff, maybe this isn't the worst thing ever either. They, they don't really look at what's inside of it, like you said. Like they're not they're not buying QQQ and checking out like that ETF and checking out every stock that it holds or when they change the holdings, you know, and make Facebook the third highest holding instead of the seventh highest holding. When As, you when you invest in an index. You get the returns of the index, but you also get the volatility of the index. Yes. Qs are very volatile. S and P is very volatile. You know, so. Yeah, and what's the you know, people always talk about the value versus growth. I try not to be like the perma bull on stuff because market conditions obviously can change. What has happened in the past does not mean it will be the case in the future. But what what about all the people out there, including me, who are so eager to just say, well, just put the money in tech because that's where all the innovation goes and that's where it's going to be. So that's where we should be. Why the fuck are we wasting our time with value stocks and more traditional type things like a caterpillar or something like that? So two things. Uh, one, I've seen a couple of cycles in value and growth. Growth has been outperforming for the last 20 years. Now, I take that back. There's been some hiccups along the way, but growth has mostly been outperforming. Right. Um it's not always going to be the case. I don't know when the turn is going to be. I can't predict it. It's not always going to be the case. You know who Dave Ramsey is, right? Of course, yeah. Okay. He's a ding dong. So <laughs> I've heard this from a yeah. lot of people. So yeah. he what his the investment advice he gives to people is that you should put all of your money in growth mutual funds. Like aggressive growth mm. mutual funds. Again, the returns are great. You, th those average 12% a year, 14% a year. But if you invest in an index, you also get the volatility of the index. And he's telling these Christians in Tennessee <laughs> to put their money in QQQ. That's where God wants it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. And it, it, he's he's got all these like these knuckleheads in Tennessee like like watching their stocks every day, you know? Yeah, it, I I like I've been trying to de-stress my life a little bit, you know, and I haven't I haven't been in a position to really look at like stocks or something to the point of, of building this business. It's more like how I'm managing the cash flow of this business. But 
when I do start being able to put money to work, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to be one of these idiots who's just like, well, I'll just put it in the basic Vanguard thing and call it a day. I, I understand that. you got to be a little more tactical about it. But I like that concept of being able to look at it and say, okay, you're going to actually diversify across five different asset classes and – Here's what you can expect over time. And and the key is diversifying across asset classes, right? So a lot of people say, I'm going to buy an S&P 500 mutual fund. It's got 500 stocks in it. I'm diversified. You're not diversified. Mm. Like there's 30 million other people who do the exact same thing. You're not diversified. So you say, okay, I'm going to add some bonds to my stocks, right? Well, bonds and stocks are positively correlated at the moment. So you're not really diversifying your risk, you're compounding your risk. And they're both financial assets. That's what they have in common. They, they're both financial assets. So then you have to diversify to hard assets mm. like real estate and gold and commodities. So gold in particular is the best diversifier in the world. I call gold the Dennis Rodman of asset classes. Okay, And if you think about Dennis Rodman, you're making our sponsor happy right now. <laughs> Noble Gold Investments. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about Dennis Rodman, he's he's in the Hall of Fame. He's one of the best basketball players of all time. There was a lot of debate about whether he should be in the Hall of Fame because he doesn't score. He's he, he scores He though. scores like 6 points yeah. a game. But what does he do? He can rebound and pass to other people. If you had a whole team full of Dennis Rodmans, it would be the worst team in the world. Yes. It would never score. Yes. But when you take Dennis Rodman and you add it to four other guys that can score, it becomes the best team in the world. That's what gold does. If you had a portfolio that was 100% gold, it would suck. Right. Like, it would suck. But when you take gold and add it to four other things then it becomes the best portfolio in the world because it has very weak correlation to stocks and bonds and real estate and anything else. So when you add it to a portfolio, you bring down the volatility. That's the purpose of gold. What is it about gold that makes it, throughout human history, so timeless and so recognized and, so, and, and the ultimate traditional cultural symbol across all these different cultures of wealth and success? Because it maintains its purchasing power over time, okay? A car right now is $40,000, which is like 20 ounces of gold. In 1970, a car was 20 ounces of gold. In 1930, a car was 20 ounces of gold. Like, it maintains its purchasing power over time. Doesn't matter what the dollar does, so... And we took the, I mean, famously, we took the dollar off the gold standard at Nixon, which kind of started with FDR, though with the new deal. So before that, that's something that sometimes I get confused at. Before FDR first introduced a way to get around this, in order for them to print money, it had to, tell me if I get this right, it had to be earmarked to the gold bullion that the government held? Is that what it was? I actually don't know the history. You don't no. on that? But why, why do people complain so much about us going off the gold standard? Because it gives guys like Jay Powell the power to just print money without anything you're marking it? Yes. Yes. There's actually, I don't know if you want to bring this up. There's a cool website called WTF happened in 1971. <laughs> and so if you go if you go to WTF happened in 1971, you will see a bunch of charts that show that really weird things started to happen when we went off the gold standard, right? So this is where productivity and compensation so basically, worker salaries stopped going up, even though their productivity went up. And that happened in 1971. That's a huge gap. Yeah. Because percentage, you know, I always tried to make people think in this. I'm like, question I would always ask a client, I swear to God, they never got it right, was if I have $100 and I lose 50%, what do I have? They say 50 bucks. I say how much percentage points do I have to make up now to get back to 100? 100%. Exactly. Yeah. You're hurt more on the way down than you're on the way up. So when I see something like this where you're like, oh, well, one of them's up 116. But then product, I think, what was that, the top chart, Alessia, if you go up? It was productivity was up 246, compensation up 115. You're like, well, it's still up 150. Look at the spread there. 115 versus 246 compounded over time. Are you fucking kidding me? That's a That's monumental. And that's why, you know, if you ever read Steven Pinker's stuff at all? 
No. So he talks a lot about how we are in statistically the best time in human history and how there's minor setbacks that occur, you know, each decade sometimes, but overall we move forward. And he's he's right statistically. But one of the things that's happening right now that you look at a lot is we have the wealth gap separating where we are basically nubbing down the middle class and we're getting more to this winner take all society. Mm-hmm. Is there a way if you had the power, if you were the head of the Federal Reserve and actually wanted to keep it for a minute, is there a way we could fix that? If I was chairman of the Fed, I would get rid of myself. I would get rid of the Fed. Well, if, if you think about you, whatever you are, president, whatever you are. So go back to 2008. We had the financial crisis. Yes. Right. And September, no, November of 2008, Bernanke starts doing quantitative easing. Head of the Fed at the time. Right. Yeah. So what Bernanke was worried about was deflation. Okay, like he was wor- like he was a scholar of the depression. Uh, have you seen the movie Boys in the Boat? Have you no. seen that yet? Boys in the Boat is a super interesting movie because uh, it takes place in 1936 during the depression and it kind of shows how awful it was. Like yeah. people didn't have food, like it was terrible. So he was worried about deflation. So he actually wanted to cause inflation. Well, he didn't cause inflation in goods and services. He caused inflation in asset prices. So stocks went straight up and right, real and estate it, went straight up. Okay. All right. All right. Which that, that and, and if you if you go back to 2008, that's when inequality really started to get bad when it when it first began. Because quantitative easing targeted assets and made assets price go up. And who owns assets? It's rich people. Right. The people who maybe took a huge hit during the crisis, but they didn't go to zero. Yep. They, didn't, they didn't have to worry about putting food on the table so they could recover faster. That's the thing. It's like when I'm running, I, I try to do this math in my head. I always fuck it up. But like if you're running up a hill in a race with somebody and they're running faster and they get to the top of the hill, they're getting to the downhill before you. And, like, it's supposed to be that, well, once they get on flat ground, you're on the downhill and you catch up. But in the stock market, it's not really like that. Yeah. You need money to make money. It's a huge – yeah. I mean, how do you how do you change that, though, with people? If, if, if I'm the average father of, let's say, two or – let's say three kids out there, right? I got a wife and three kids. I work a nine-to-five job, maybe even an eight-to-six job. I pull – Let's say I live in New Jersey. I pull 100k a year. Yep. I'm floating by, man. How do I? How 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 would you say? Here's how. Minus your 2020 2020 portfolio. Here's how you could set up a plan to be able to make yourself successful while still keeping that job and keeping the same level you are right now to be able to not necessarily keep up, but at least like follow in the path of someone making 500 grand a year. Let me see the book. Slide that over to yeah. me. So I actually talk about this in the beginning of the book. Um, in the first chapter, the first chapter is um, part one is about attitude. attitude. Okay. So I talk about, you know, a lot of people, they work at the widget factory, they make a hundred grand a year and they're like, I make what I make. So people get put into a position where they think that the only way to make more money is to cut expenses. Okay. Mm. So they, they cut Netflix, um, they cut dry cleaning, they cut, uh, expensive food, they cut going out to eat, they cut coffee and cutting expenses blows. Like it's, it's, it sucks. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. But you know, the personal finance experts don't really tell people another solution, which is make more money. So what are some ways you can make more money? Well, you can ask for a raise. Maybe you get a raise. You can get a second job. You can work longer hours. You can change careers to something completely different that makes more money. You can go to school to learn something to change careers. You can do passive income, right? You can like buy houses and rent them out, or you could start a business. Even like they call it, today, they call it a side hustle. You can sell little rings on Etsy or some bullshit yep. like that. But, you know, the point is, is that you might be able to cut 3000 a year in expenses. But if you if you work at it, it's called focusing on the revenue side. There's a whole chapter in here yes. called the revenue side. You focus on the revenue side and what you can do to bring in more money. 
it involves more work, but it's a lot more fun than cutting expenses. So. Yeah, and that's kind of, that's just that's a cultural phenomenon. People are always like, okay, well, I can cut this, cut that, but you're taking away utility. It affects your mood. It affects it affects your attitude. You're right. That's that, that's that's a good way to start off. Real quick, I just gotta go to the bathroom. We'll be right back though. All right, we're back. Another thing you talked about in this book is, I believe it's at the end, is the concept of stability and what that means financially to people. And and sometimes I think like that's just a a made up word. We're always searching for stability, but we never really have it when when we get there. How how do you look at stability in managing your financial life? Well, the goal is to have a healthy relationship with money. Most people don't. I would say 80% of people don't. 20% of people do. Um, you can either be two things. You can spend too much or you can spend too little. The people who spend too much, <clears throat> this is what like Dave Ramsey likes to talk about. It's some asshole with a $100,000 truck mm-hmm. and a 580 credit score and his car payment's bigger than his house payment. And he just spends like he's, he's, got, he's deep into credit card debt. Right. And we say, this person is the bad person, right? We don't want to be like this guy. So what we're going to do is the opposite. We're going to be the cheapest fucks of all time. <laughs> Right, we're gonna we're gonna buy like generic canned soup, and we're gonna have like one suit that's like ninety nine dollars that we got at Belk, and we're gonna get, <laughs> we're gonna have a fourteen year old Chrysler Sebring that smells like cigarette smoke. We're just gonna be like cheap fucks. Right. So those are the two ends of the those are the two extremes. The goal is to be in the middle. The goal is to be in the middle. These people on the extremes don't have a healthy relationship with money. Mm. If you're super cheap, what are you doing? You're thinking about money all the time. Even if you go to the soda machine, you're like, eh, I don't know if I can afford a dollar for a soda. Yes. Like, it, 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 like, basically all your decisions are ruled by this framework that like you have to save as much money as possible. It's decision fatigue, too. Decision fatigue. That's yeah. a good way of putting it. And on the other end, like you're always trying to make the next car payment, the next house payment, like you're in debt up to your eyeballs. So the right way to be is in the middle and have a healthy relationship with money. And that's, you know, when I wrote that book, like that's, that's, that's how I live my life. You know, like I don't think about the small stuff. I think about the big stuff. It's funny. Um, I just got a text from my wife. I'm selling my house. Right. Right now. Yeah, I'm selling my house. I, I'm building a house, uh, 15 minutes away, and we're selling the old house. And it's been on the market for three months, and it's not selling. And um, we have lowered the price. We have lowered the price, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Ooh, whoa. Yeah. So now you think about this. I got an Uber on the way over here. Right. The Uber was like sixty bucks. Like some people would be like, I'm taking the path. I'm t- like, I'm taking the train, I'm taking, uh, you know, I'm, g- I'm going to take the path or I'll take the ferry or something like that. And I'm like, I'm like, fuck it. It's like 60 bucks. Like who cares? So like it's small stuff. Yes. What's big is the 250,000 that I've lowered on my house, you know? Mm. So the goal is to focus on the big things, not the little things. The little things do not matter. And basically what we tell people in America is that the little things matter, right? Yes. We tell people that the little things matter. Make your bed in the morning. There was that Navy admiral like 10 years ago that gave that commencement speech about making your bed. Then he got a book deal out of it. Make your bed, (laughs) right? Like, it doesn't fucking matter. I don't make my bed. I don't make my bed. I just get out of bed and I leave it and I have a great day. Like, it does (laughs) not matter. But we tell people the little stuff matters. Susie Orman will tell you, don't buy coffee. Don't buy coffee. But if, what if, if I like it? If you go to Starbucks, if you spend $4 on a coffee, then it's a waste of money. And so here's the math, right? I go to Dunkin' Donuts every morning in Myrtle Beach, okay? I get a $3.81 iced coffee, okay? I do it because I have to take a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even like the coffee that much. I get, I but I got to go to the bathroom, right? So you have to get Dunkin's to take the shit. I have to get Dunkin's. So two hundred and twenty-five days a year, I get a three dollar and eighty cent coffee. That's nine hundred dollars a year. 
If I save $900 a year over 40 years, that's $36,000. If I invest that $36,000 in the stock market, maybe I get like a hundred grand, right? Mm -hmm. So if I give up, if I give up taking a shit my entire life, <laughs> if I never take a dump ever again, I will have a hundred thousand dollars when I retire. What is wrong with that? Yeah. What's wrong with that is we cannot give up small luxuries. If you ask somebody to give up something they love on a daily basis every day for 40 years, yes. they can't stick with the program. They'll give up. They'll give up and they'll just go back to spending. Yes. So they cannot stick with the program. So it's your whether you have money is not the product of a million small decisions. It's three big decisions. How big of a house do you get? How expensive of a car do you get? And how much student loans do you have? If you get those three things right, coffee doesn't matter, Uber rides don't matter, dry cleaning doesn't matter, it just does not matter. Sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Don't sweat this one. Yeah. Yeah, so a couple things here. First of all, we all know people like those two extremes that you pointed out. Yep. Someone spending way more than they have and someone who fucking every little thing, they're like, I can't afford that. I look at it from a strictly utility standpoint. For, that's why I said decision fatigue because I had heard Jesse Itzler years ago He was on when he was on with Joe Rogan. He talked about how – the average human being has to make, I want to say it was thirty to 50,000 decisions a day. Everything from do I make a left or a right to go to the bathroom and stuff like that all the way up to am I going to buy this thing or am I not? And he's like the more decisions you have, the more stress you have, the more things you have to worry about. And so with money, you know, prime example, my dad's a lawyer. He does well. My dad's never ordered delivery in the history of my life. <laughs> It went, when I would order delivery, he thought the world was going to end. He's like, why the <laughs> fuck would you do that? We'll go pick it up. I said, no. We're going to drive 11 minutes that way. I'm going to stop what I'm doing, get in my car, stand in there and wait for five minutes while someone says, get this fucking order ready because it's not ready because it's never fucking ready on time. I'm gonna, then going to drive back home here. I'm going to spend whatever it is, two, four dollars on gas and 25 minutes of my time. Break my focus because you want to save seven dollars on or ten dollars on delivery. I'm like, that's worth the ten dollars and you yeah. shouldn't be thinking about that. But so I many know. people, especially from that, from that area, like the boom and Gen X, a lot of them do think that way. It's culturally baked in, like you, know, you said. Have you ever heard of uh, Mr. Money Mustache? I don't you think ever heard so. of Mr. You've heard of the fire movement? Like the, the fire, fire free speech never, movement? No. You yeah. ever heard of this? Yeah. All right. Mr. Money Mustache is a guy with a mustache who lives in Colorado, and he started this movement called the fire movement and stands for financial independence, retire early. Hmm. Right? And basically what he tells people to do is – you graduate from college, age 32. This guy. You work you work 15 years. You save 70% of your income. You just live in complete deprivation. You save 70% of your income. Then you retire at age 35, and you live off that money for the rest of your life. And you can do whatever. You have all the time in the world. You're 35 years old. For, for 50 years, you can just sit on your ass, and you can just live off that money. Okay. Anyway, the reason I brought up Mr. Money Mustache is because on his blog, he talks about making a pizza. He's like, I'm not going to order a fucking pizza. I'm going to make a pizza, <laughs> right? So I'm like, okay, you're going to spend three hours yeah. making the dough, cutting up the vegetables, like, you know, like making your own sauce. You're going to bake it three hours of your time. If your time is worth $25 an hour. Yep. Yeah. It's $75 plus the $5 of in ingredients. It's an $80 pizza. People, people for some reason, don't get the time value of money. Agreed. You know, they, like, they don't understand it. Like, they can't do the math. You know, I think about that all the time. Well, that's also, like, one of the, you know, you, you'll talk, especially, like, the Bitcoin guys. They're always talking about that. And it's funny because when I, when I hear you talk, you have a way of hitting a lot of the same notes and well-placed complaints that they do but you're not in that camp which is almost like some good self-control i guess on on your part if 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 you don't believe in that but you know we, we've touched on today but do you think that maybe if it's not bitcoin something like that that puts more of like a libertarian effect on society where you're more responsible for yourself do you think that that could 
that could fix all this too, where where people are so worried about every dollar and cent because there's also things that they don't that are out of their control monetarily that that they do to make a living. Everything is within our control. We all get to choose how much money we have. We all get to choose. What do you mean? Well, you, you choose how much money you have. I have no idea how much you make on this podcast, right? And obviously you want it to be as big as possible. But if it wasn't a lot of money, you could go back to Wall Street. You could sure. do something else. Like the amount of money you're making doing this is your choice, okay? And however big or however small you want to make it, it's your choice. Same thing with my business, newsletter business. Newsletter business, look, I told you I'm building a, you know, like a big gangster palace, right? Newsletter <laughs> business is pretty good. But honestly, there are things I could do to make more money. I could be a strategist at a bank. Okay, I could do that. I could run a pod at Millennium. I could do that. I could be making five, ten, fifteen million dollars a year doing a bunch of different things. I choose to do the newsletter because I enjoy it. Right. Right. It's it, like it brings me enjoyment. I choose how much money we have. We all choose how much money we have. Like, if you have a a person, they're like, I want to be a teacher. I want to be an educator. Okay. You know how much teachers make, right? It's not very much. You're going to love your job. You're going to love working with kids. You are choosing to make less money on purpose. You are, that is a choice. Mm. If money was important to you, you would choose something else. Maybe you would be a real estate agent. And maybe if you're a real estate agent, that is a choice. And maybe there's something else you could be doing. We all get to choose. It's completely within our power how much money we make. Sometimes I think about this with everyone having like the dream, right? And the dream is, I don't necessarily mean the American dream. I mean where you can work preferably for yourself doing something you love and make a lot of money. Even if it's not like the most you could possibly make, you know, you, you do very well. You never got to think about money. But then you look at what society needs. And for example, society not only needs teachers, it needs good teachers. But they're not financially incentivized to do it. So what you're saying, though, is also that that means that mathematically speaking, there are a lot of people in this country moving forward who we're going to need to make, maybe I'll put a word on it, the dumb decision to take a job like that in light instead of another job that they could take so that society continues to function. You know, you're going to love my opinion on this. So I'm a pretty conservative libertarian guy. I think we should pay teachers a lot more money. I agree. I think we should pay teachers. And education is one of the few problems in the world that you can fix by throwing money at it. Literally, you just throw money at it and it gets better. If you pay teachers $80,000 a year, in South Carolina, they make like $29,000 a year. Ooh. It's like insane. If you, may, if you pay teachers $80,000 a year instead of $40,000 a year, you're going to get much better people who want to be teachers. It's a better incentive. You're going to get better, better education. Like there's some parts in the country, New Jersey is one of them, Connecticut, California, teachers are paid pretty well, you know, but I would say for 45 out of the 50 states, they're paid like shit. Yeah. And literally all you have to do is throw money at it, raise teacher salaries, things get better. Who throws the money? The government? Well, I mean, ultimately taxpayers, but it's worth right, it. Right, right. It's worth it. Like I would, I would rather spend money on education than a whole bunch of other things. So, well, it also it, this is another thing I've been going back and forth with in my head recently. You know, we're living in a time, and you talk about it in this book, where, for example, higher education costs a fucking arm and a leg. There's kids who, at the age of seventeen will sign their name to a document because they want to go drink and fuck for four years and have a good time and not realize what that's going to do them at 27, 37, maybe 47. If they're not smart with their money. And we're also living at a time where a lot of the higher institutions right now are not having their best moment from an educational <laughs> perspective, right? So what's forming? Well, the opinion out there is starting to form, and I've been a part of it, by the way, I have to say this, where... People are like, well, maybe it's time to rethink education. We got YouTube now. We have unlimited access to things online to learn. Just educate yourself. And now I'm starting to wonder if that's also like – that pretty much has no precedent around the world where education is not valued in a high-level society. So if this is all like some sort of attack 
from outside of our country maybe on our education system to remove all trust in it so that you know we don't even trust grade schoolers. I mean I, I hear people talking about homeschooling their kids now and stuff. You know what I mean? And that in in essence crash the system in on itself. Do you worry about that from like a geopolitical power standpoint of this country? I don't know about a geopolitical standpoint, but I can tell you that we have too many people going to college. We have too many we just I think you're right. And we we don't have enough people not going to college. I went to a beer distributor in Wisconsin. This is like 5 years ago. And the guy told me he was hiring college graduates to work in sales and paying them 55,000 a year. He was hiring high school dropouts to drive trucks and making 110,000 a year. <laughs> like we have an oversupply of people with degrees and an undersupply of people without them. We need less people to go to college. So I don't know if you've ever heard about the higher education bubble, right? It's, it is a bit of a, it's like, it's almost a behavioral or sentiment concept. Like it's a bubble. And what we believed for many years was that in order to succeed in life, you needed a college education. I can't tell you how many people I've run into in Myrtle Beach you have a guy with a high school education. He starts working at an HVAC company. He works there for 10 years. He gets the bright idea to start his own. He grows it. He builds it. After 20 years, he sells it for 10 million bucks, and then he lives in a gated community. No no college education. Yeah. You, you have to think about what the purpose of a college education is, and there's two purposes. One is to prepare people for jobs. That is a purpose. And the other is to educate them, make them enlightened people, Right. And the colleges don't believe, if you ask any faculty member at a university, they don't believe in the first purpose. They don't believe in preparing you for a job. They're like, that's not what we're here for. We're here, we're here to make you an educated citizen. And that's, that's where the universities are failing that's us. That's a problem. Yeah. That's where the universities are failing us because the, the part of their purpose is to prepare people to work in the workforce for sure. So. I mean, think about how much we talked about compounding money a few minutes ago. Think about how much the difference is between a kid who gets convinced into, I'll just use the most stereotypical one, to go into college at 30 grand a year in loans to get a gender studies degree where then they can't use it for anything. They're out of college, eight years out of college, they're working a job that doesn't even require a degree, making 50 grand. Whereas the other kid who went in, didn't go to college, didn't take on that debt, started making money from 18 to 22, they're making positive money without debt at the same time that this person, this other person is in college going further into debt and then they're making, to use your example with the beer distributor one, they're making 110 versus 55 against that person. They are now, the chart is going like that. Yeah. And one person's enlightened. That's not worth it. I mean, it, it's easy to pick on gender studies. That's kind of the, you yes, know, the, the straw man, right? Yes. You know, there's there's quite a few degrees that don't have a lot of usefulness in the real world. Um, you have a lot of people who get who graduate with one of those degrees and they have six figures in debt and they're waiting tables. And here's what happens: 2009, Obama signed a law, okay, and it set up what was called income-based repayment plans. Okay, so if you go to college and you have a hundred thousand dollars in debt. The payment on that would be twelve hundred a month, fifteen hundred a month, something like that. But what the government does is means test you and say, "Well, you're waiting tables. You're making forty grand a year, so you can afford three hundred a month. So that's what you're going to pay." But that doesn't cover your obligation. Like the interest expense that you're not paying is being negatively amortized. It's being added to the back of the loan. Mm. So I don't know how many times you've seen this on Twitter, but somebody will tweet. I've been, I, I graduated with $70,000 in debt and I've been making payments for 20 years and now I have $100,000 in debt. Let's vote for Bernie Sanders. Right. Right. Like how right. many times have you seen that? A lot. Yeah. And it's because of the law that Obama signed in 2009. If people had to make those payments, like the larger payments that they should be making, and if they knew in advance, like if somebody told them at age 18, Look, if you're going to borrow 100 grand to get this degree, you're going to be making payments of 1500 a month. They probably wouldn't do it, right? But they're being shielded from the economic consequences of their actions through these reduced payments. Why did he, why did we make that a law in the first place? 
just out of pure altruism because, hey, let's help these people out. We're, we're from the government. We're here to help. We're going to help these people. But it doesn't help them because, like, it's, it's, it's negative amortization. It gets added to the back of the loan. That's the problem. And here's a, here's a good example of the pendulum, though, that, I, I mean, if I had an answer for this, you and I wouldn't be talking right now. But you look at that. You just said that law was 09. Right. Yep. We can point to a lot of other things that happened in 09, 10, 11. We can point to a lot of things that happened in 1930, 1931, 1932, where the exuberance and lack of regulation leads to this disaster. But then to fix the disaster, we go the opposite way and we regulate the shit out of everything, which then eventually somehow either leads to the next disaster or it gets pulled off because people get sick of it. Everything goes back to deregulation at some point and then leads to a disaster. How, how do you, is that just going to be human nature over and over again? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. I mean, there's, there's people in government who understand this, you know. Um, I keep going back to Argentina. Javier Malay is really like, he's the best politician in the world. I mean, think of this. And I don't, I really didn't mean to change the subject. I'm sorry. No, no, it's great. But Go with it. Since 1946... Argentina has lived under Peronism on and off, really for like 70 or 80 years. What's Peronism? Uh, Eva Peron was elected in 1946. She, um, it's sort of like a combination of fascism and socialism, but it's really, it's Sounds this nice. en enlargement of the welfare state. Mm. Like Argentina has a massive welfare state. Like a huge percent of the population is on welfare, right? So um, that's hard to undo. Right. And things had to get bad enough in Argentina where they elected a guy who is a hardcore anarcho capitalist to rip off the band aid and just fix it. And things are not bad enough here. Like Dan Bongino, do you ever listen to him? No. Okay. You know who he is? Yeah. Okay. So uh, sometimes I'm in the car, I turn on his radio show. He says this a lot. He's like, things just aren't bad enough. Like mm. people. People don't change. People don't change when they see the light. They change when they feel the heat. Yes, things have to get really, really bad. So, you know, Biden tried to um, cancel student loans, which was denied by the Supreme Court. Uh, I think he knew that was going to happen, and I think he did that gesture just so he could say he tried to do political something. Political points, yeah, yeah. score political points. Um, but the student loans are here to stay. You know, so. Can, can we go back to Argentina? Yeah. Because it's this is something i got to do a deeper dive on. But this guy, we mentioned it earlier, one of the things he wants to do is like, what what, what is he? He goes down the line, he goes, afuera, afuera, afuera. <laughs> like at every single, he goes, like, la, la destrucción of government, afuera. And he just wants to cancel everything in the government. Okay, so he's a libertarian. He wants to minimize the state, up the, the freedom of the markets. How much power as their president will he actually have to get his ideologies into place? And how what are how's Argentina going to change from a on the global stage if if he can? I don't I don't know a lot about um, like the civic structure in Argentina, like who's in Congress, like what the what the makeup is. I don't really know a lot about that. I can tell you that. He was popular when he was elected. He won by 56 to 44, yeah. and he's become more popular. He's become more popular. So even though he doesn't have as many members in his party in Congress, he has the will of the people behind him. They want to make these changes. So, you know, like I said, I own a couple of stocks in Argentina, and um, I just tell people I'm not selling them for 10 years. You know, Argentina, here's an interesting factoid. How long is his term? Uh, four years. Okay. Here's an interesting factoid. Argentina, the Argentina stock market makes up 9% of their GDP. The, the United States stock market is like 170% of our GDP. So if you think about, if he introduces these economic reforms and how much that stock market has the potential to grow, I mean, it's, it's astronomical. Wow. You know? What was our percentage again? I think it's like 170. Yeah, one one of the, th you know, sometimes I'll have guests in here 
where a line rings in my head. It changes the game for something, something different every time. But there's probably been 15, 20 times in here where someone said something that made me just go, wait, that's that's exactly right. Oh, my God, why did I never think of that? And one of them was when Andy Bustamante said the first time I had him in, he said the only thing that matters on the geopolitical stage is your GDP. That's it. He said if you are making the most money and producing the most for the world, whether you're, you know, even if you're ranked on the list, right, you are more important than the people below you. And it makes you think right now because we've talked about like the dollar instability, potential instability. We talked about, you know, some of the some of the shifts in the world. But one of the things that you've been incredibly good at being able to read ahead of time is geopolitical trends and how it's going to impact the world order, if you will. So as an example, your my favorite call you ever made was this Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, who I believe just stepped down last yep. year. God, she was a bitch, man. <laughs> she was in there for like six, seven years, and I had no idea who she was until you wrote a dirt nap on it the second she won or was about to win. It was before, yeah. It was before she yeah. won an election. Where did, how did you, basically you nailed it. You nailed what she was. She was, you know, this very hardcore left-wing movement, hardcore socialist, was going to do X, Y, and Z to New Zealand. I'll let you lay it out. But what what made you be able to, to call the shot literally bar for bar like that? Well, I knew a little bit about New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand in the 1970s was a very socialist country very socialist and economically depressed. They were just a backwater. And they had a prime minister in the 70s or 80s. His name was John Key. And he was part of that whole Reagan-Thatcherite revolution mm. in the early 80s. And John Key totally you know, deregulated, lowered taxes, uh, turned the country around economically, and New Zealand became a very rich country. And they had had labor governments along the way, but they had been you know, mostly centrist labor governments. And you know, it, along comes Jacinda Ardern, who was far left. Um, and, you know, New Zealand is kind of this tiny country at the bottom of the world. They're in this weird time zone. They have a bunch of sheep and cows and stuff like that. Lord of the Rings, and, too. Like, <laughs> like, nobody really pays attention to what's going on in New Zealand. Um, you did. Yeah. Jacinda Ardern, I don't know if you remember this. You talked about the five eyes. While she was prime minister, New Zealand was pretty much kicked out of the five eyes because she was so far left and she was aligning with China. So, yeah, I mean, that I saw that article. Like, that was for real. Whoa. Um, but anyway, it's a funny story about that Jacinda Ardern thing, and I told you earlier, but I'll tell it again. I was, uh, I was writing for Forbes at the time, and I had done this research on Jacinda, and I wrote a Forbes article, and Forbes – doesn't have editors. Yeah, this is wild to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you write an article and post it, nobody looks at it. And it, it, it's on the internet. Like, there's no there's no make sense check on it. Oh, my God. So I wrote this article about Jacinda, and I, I, I basically talked about that whole history that I just told you. And I said that, and, and it was really about economics. I wasn't talking about, you know, vaccines or anything like that. I was just talking about economics. Yeah, this is and, before all that. Yeah. yeah. And I said, I said uh, sh she's, she's going she's gonna to fuck the place up. And I posted it, and I went to bed, and the next morning, I had Facebook messages from TV studios in New Zealand. I had Twitter <laughs> messages. I had angry people in New Zealand, like, tweeting at me. Like, they were, like, Googling me and looking up parts of my background, and, like, they're saying, like, oh, he's, like, a failed author or something <laughs> like that. Like, and, and the TV studios wanted me to go on TV in New Zealand to talk about this. And I said, uh, I, it, it was Thanksgiving. It was literally Thanksgiving Day, and I said, guys, it's a holiday here in the U.S. I'm not doing it, and I just never did it. But Yeah, I mean, it, but th that's that goes to show you, though, like these – this is something we've seen in recent years as it's become so-called this U.S. like China world. You have your teammates on this side, and you have your teammates on that mm -hmm. side. And for whatever reason, especially during the pandemic – Jacinda is certainly self-explanatory, but then you look at the bigger one over there, like Australia, they kind of leaned 
towards the Chinese influence, right? Lock everyone in their home, have helicopters above, question them when they post something on Facebook. What What is it? Is it strictly the tit-for-tat economic relationship is so tied to China that they can then kind of, without saying, force certain behaviors? Or is it an actual adoption of ideology? No, it's it's really about economics. I mean, Australia in, part, in particular exports a huge amount of commodities to China. And they value that relationship, and that's that's really all there that, all there is to it. By the way, the guy so Jacinda stepped down. Um, she didn't finish her second term, and um, the guy that just won prime minister of New Zealand is a guy named Chris Luxon, who was the CEO of the major airline there. I think it's New Zealand Air, mm. and he's you know for if you think about this, Jacinda was so bad <laughs> that they had to like elect a CEO as <laughs> as pres as prime minister to like as like a complete you know opposition to what she stood for during her presidency so Why and did, he's great by the way he's great what was the what was the reason she stepped down that she gave um what was the real reason? well i mean i think she was just going to spend time with her family but really like she was like bombing in the polls yeah and she wasn't going to get reelected so yeah i mean that happened that happened fast because also like it felt like especially during the pandemic some of these governments just enjoyed it like they they enjoyed there's something about the human beings who ran these places are just like oh we love telling people what to do you know i i don't i, I don't want to um like sort of relitigate everything that happened in the pandemic i live in a red state um i live in south carolina and the governor is a guy named henry mcmaster who was a U.S. attorney under Reagan. He's not really a Reaganite. He's more of a Trump guy. He's old. He's in his 70s. Yeah, he was the lieutenant governor before, right? Yeah, he was. Yeah. When Nikki Haley left. Yes. Yeah. Um, but living in South Carolina during the pandemic was awesome. Like, mm. basically, like, the pandemic happened in February, and by May, everybody was out and about. Um, and, you know, you had to wear a mask and stuff, but it, was, it really was was not that bad, so... Yeah, way different than here. Yeah. I mean, it was like, shit. That was, when did we really start? Well, you were down in Miami, so that was different. I think it, it, it didn't even loosen up until maybe like May 2021. I mean, we're talking 14 months where, I mean, it worked out for me. I was in building a studio, like building the podcast in a yep. studio, so it didn't really affect me as much, and people still came to be on the podcast, but... I mean, looking around, so many people who maybe didn't have something they were building were just locked inside the the damage of that. I don't even know how you reverse it. But it's crazy that that is now – the pandemic breaking out is literally almost four years ago now. Yeah, and when I think about the pandemic, I really think about the economic effects. I don't yeah. I don't really care about the max, mass or vaccines. It's not my bailiwick, but um, we pumped – three trillion dollars worth of stimulus into this economy like and we didn't we didn't raise three trillion of taxes we went into debt three trillion and just handed it out to people ppp loans and stimulus checks and child credits and like that's what caused the inflation you know that's absolutely what caused the inflation can that get reversed no it can never be reversed so we no. can't fix that. We're just going we have, more and more into the debt. We have three trillion dollars more in the economy chasing around the same amount of goods. The only really the only way to immunize that is for the Federal Reserve to do, continue to do quantitative tightening over a period of like ten years and suck that money out of the economy. Politically, they're never going to do no. that. I think about that. I I haven't looked at a government debt chart in a while, but it makes me sick when I do because. When does it come home to roost? Like at that's, what point? That's the thing. It ha it's not bad enough yet. It's not bad enough yet. It has to get bad. So when I say it has to get bad, interest rates have to go up a lot in order for people to care about the debt. Like when I was a kid, I'm older, right? So fourth grade, 1984, I'm in Mrs. Cook's class, okay? And we used to have current events every week. And they would take out like a film strip and they would, we would watch current events. Every fucking week they talked about the debt. 
every week they talked about the debt. And like, you know, they were blaming Reagan. We had a $180 million deficit. It was about 6% of GDP. And oh my God, the debt, the debt. And that continued up until Bush one became president. And he ended up raising taxes a little bit as sort of a token gesture. Taxes went from 28% to yeah. 31%. But the, Read my lips. Yeah. I will never ra- <laughs> The the debt continued to be a political issue all throughout the nineties, and then we eventually had a we had a surplus in two thousand, and then the debt ceased to become a political issue, and then nine eleven happened, and we we started a whole new cabinet department, and then we started spending money like crazy, but the the debt is not really a, it's becoming a political issue, but it's not really a political issue that people. People don't see how it affects them personally. How if does I it? if I went if I went to a guy in the street and I said, "All right, you're shopping for a house. Your mortgage is six and a half percent. If it wasn't for all the debt that we accumulated in the last five years, your mortgage would be five and a half percent." Government borrowing crowds out but private borrowing. The government gets to borrow first. You're second in line. So when they borrow, interest rates go up, and then you have to pay higher interest rates. But even when we're doing this, just like you said, we haven't had a surplus since since fucking forever. We never have surpluses, right? So even when they're when they're trying to fix it, they're still getting deeper into debt. How does that not crash the dollar? It's it's a really long conversation. Um, we have a deficit right now of about 1.8 trillion, which is about I think nine percent of GDP, which is very high. Um, we're getting to the point where entitlement benefits, Social Security and Medicare, are becoming the biggest part of the budget. We do have discretionary spending. We can cut discretionary spending, but even if you cut discretionary spending a lot, you're not going to balance the budget because your entitlements are so big. Mm. So um, it's I don't want to say the problem is intractable. But long term, you need to make some reforms to Medicare and Social Security in order for this to work. So, And yet you've had people paying into their taxes with the promise forever, and now you'd be saying... I'm not saying take away Social Security, but there's some things you can do. Like right now, like the, the retirement age is 66. You can say, okay, the retirement age is 70. That helps, you know. Um, but then what, what about when people are living to 85 instead of 77? Well, life expectancy is actually going the other way. So. It is at the mo- <laughs> at, at, you're right. At the moment, it is. At the moment, it is. But what if it starts to go back the other way? Yeah. And then you kind of run into the same problem. I mean, people are living a lot longer now than they were 35 years ago. No. So, like these, that's that's my thing. They all feel like short term solutions. The other thing that liberals want to do, which I disagree with, is they want to means test social security benefits. So basically, those you get to retirement age and you're making like you're 66 years old and you're making 500 grand a year. No social they, security. You, you don't get social security. Yeah. So, and you don't you don't like that idea. I don't like that idea. I think I believe that if you pay if you've been paying payroll taxes the entire time, if you paid into the system your entire life, you're entitled to the benefits. So because you would view it as like a redistribution of wealth. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I mean, in, in theory, you look at things like socialism in theory, it sounds great. And you do it in practice, it's never great because the, the buck has to be in the hands of somebody, and that's going to be the people putting all, the, all those regulations on everyone else, the government, right? That's how you get communism, that's how you get fascism and all that. I agree. I do wonder sometimes about things where we still fight over it, though, like a progressive tax or something like that, you know, where if you – because it's marginal, right? So each time you go a step up – you pay a little more. Is that also something you're against? You're, you're getting into my wheelhouse here. All right. Well, I've, let's I've, wheel away. I've, I've written many articles about taxes. So um, I disagree with progressive taxation. I think we should have a flat tax. But I don't think it's politically feasible. Okay? Hmm. The closest we ever got to a flat tax was in 1986 when Reagan was president. Volcker? No. Nope. Yeah, Volcker was... Uh, Greenspan had just become Fed chair in 1986. Um, We had we went we had two tax brackets, 16 percent and 28 percent. That was it. You were in one of those two tax brackets, and I want to say the income level was around 20,000. So if you made under 20,000, you paid 16 percent, and if you made over 20,000, you paid 28 percent. Marginally or marginal? Okay, marginal. So. 
and ever since then, the tax code has become a lot more complex. We have a very, very progressive tax code, okay? Uh, I don't remember all the marginal rates off the top of my head, but basically, if you're making under about $150,000 a year, you're not really paying any tax. The first bracket's 12%, the next bracket's 14%, I think the next bracket's 22%. Um, but even if you're paying tax, you're getting most of that back in terms of itemized deductions and some mortgage interest deduction and child credits and stuff like that. Um, it's, you know, all the stuff that you've heard about the bottom 50% not really paying any income taxes is absolutely true, mm-hmm. you know? And I, the reason I believe in a flat tax is because I believe we should all, everybody, Everybody in the country, we should all have a financial stake in what's going on, right? If if you're if you don't have a financial stake in what's going on, if you're paying zero percent taxes or actually getting money back, then you have no skin in the game, right? This is one of Nassim's books, Skin in the Game, right? Yeah, like this concept yeah, of yeah. like having skin in the game. Like if if you're not contributing financially, you don't give a fuck what's going on in the country. Like you don't care. Right. If you're paying seven hundred thousand in taxes every year, then you care. Right. Right. So that's in Gartman. You remember Dennis Gartman, right? Yes. Okay. So Gartman used to talk about this all the time. He'd say the United States is going to get to the point, and this was like twenty years ago. This is like in two thousand three. He would say the United States is going to get to the point where more than half the people are not paying taxes, and the people not paying taxes are going to vote for higher taxes on the people paying taxes. Yeah, that's yeah. So he was right. Yeah, yeah. It, something changed in the culture though too, where you know it used to be maybe maybe twenty years ago, you pull up next to a guy in a Ferrari if you like cars, and you're like, "Wow, I wonder what he had to do to get that." I'd love to get that. To now, you throw a rock at it. You throw a rock at it, and you say, "I should have that too." Yep. In the mid, the five hundred pound elephant in the room, though, is that in the middle of that, you have an entire social reset. I'm not just talking about, you know, the global financial crisis. I'm not just talking about the endless wars. I'm, I'm talking about all of it put together. You had this perfect class warfare where people are pissed off to the point that it actually the the greatest symbolism to me of it ever was the two what should have been the two main candidates in 2016. If you know one side actually let the people pick their candidates in that case, it would have been Trump and Sanders. Trump and Sanders came at it from opposite ends when it comes to solutions, but they spoke to the same exact people, right? They spoke to the people who had gone the other way on that wealth gap. They spoke to the people whose jobs were getting canceled. They spoke to the people who were pissed off that a bunch of guys in suits in New York City caused the, uh, caused the 08 crisis and cost them their whole pension. They spoke to the people that were pissed off that we spent all these money on wars and devalued the dollar in, 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 in the long run with that. They spoke to all of these things, and yet, you know— that anger has now morphed into maybe the younger generations, especially like my generation and Gen Z and everything, complaining about the system with the expectations sometimes, not everyone, but sometimes where it's like, because the system's fucked, you should pay me for it. And I shouldn't have to work to try to improve the system or improve my way up the system. Um. Well, first of all, let me say that I'm really glad that Bernie Sanders was not the candidate <laughs> because he had a real shot at winning. Yeah. And then then we would all be fucked. We, we would be we would be paying a lot more in taxes. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to do what? Like 75% of Well, something? he wanted wealth taxes. And he wanted uh wealth taxes that kicked in at I think like 8 million dollars in wealth uh at a rate of like 6% or something like that. It was How would insane. that work? You know you know anything about wealth taxes? Not really. Okay. So well, there's wealth taxes in like six countries in the world. They used to have them in France. I think they have them in Switzerland. I don't remember the other places, maybe Denmark. But a wealth tax is when, let's say I have $10 million in assets, right? The IRS comes and they look at my brokerage account and they look at my house and they look at my boat and they look at my car. They look at all my assets and they say it's worth $10 million. We're taking... One or two percent of that. Oh shit! Like an appraiser. Yeah, like an appraiser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? So, um, 
Yeah, I'm surprised you haven't heard about this. Yeah, yeah. that was like a big thing in 2016. So I don't um, remember it, but in France, France imposed a wealth tax, and two things happened. First of all, anybody who was rich left the country. They just left. And number two, they spent more money trying to collect the tax than they actually collected in tax. Because anybody that was rich sued the government, right? Because basically they're doing an appraisal on their businesses, their homes and stuff like that. So they took them to court and argued the valuation. They had thousands of court cases where the government had to make their case on the valuation. And they actually spent more money trying to collect the tax than they actually collected in tax. So Whoa. wealth taxes don't work. They yeah, don't work. That, that, that sounds like a terrible idea. I just yeah. see all the ways that that would, that would go wrong. And, but you, you point out like France, which is in just one of many examples here. You know, we've seen these movements of hard left, hard right happen. I mean, you had, you had an election that had like Marine Le Pen in France, who was more of a hard right. And I guess Macron is harder left. He's not like hard, hard left, but you know, he's left. And there seems to be in all different countries with different situations on the ground, a uniform movement across the world that splits people like that. Do you think that that can reset at some point here? And do you think it's going to take, like you said, the example, you know, something extremely bad, worse than a pandemic to get that to reset to more moderation? Well, first of all, like right and left don't mean the same things today as they did 20 years ago. That's right. You know, yeah. they mean different things. Um, I remember when I was in college in, in the 90s, like people used to talk about being um, – I'm, I'm having a brain fart um, – socially liberal and fiscally conservative. You ever yes. heard that before? Oh, of people course. would say that socially liberal and fiscally conservative. Yes. Well, now everybody is fiscally liberal and socially conservative. <laughs> we are? A, that's the that's what people are now. Yes. What makes you say that? Well, fiscally liberal for sure, right? So we're I mean we're, we're running the biggest deficits in history, so we're right. fiscally liberal and socially conservative. Believe it or not, all this. All the stuff about gender theory and stuff right. like that is actually conservatism. It is. All right. Defend that one. All right. I'm going to do my best. I wasn't really ready to talk about this. but Well, we're putting you on the spot. Okay. Um, it's really – the word liberal means f free or freedom, right? Mm. Okay. So – when I say – when somebody wants to impose gender norms on me or make me use pronouns or stuff like that, they're trying to restrict my freedom. They're actually conservative. I actually view that as oh, you're the at opposite that of – definition. Yeah, I, I view, look at it as the, as the opposite of liberal. Yeah. But technically, conser the so you're looking at the literal definition of the words. But to counter that, conservative means – in political parlance, it's like we have these ideas that as a society are generally accepted and we want to keep it that way. Yep. Whereas liberal says, no, we want the freedom for these new ideas to come in. Inevitably, you know, the sides fight and they want their ideas to respectively be the actual definition, not like a hey, – The reason we brought this up, we were talking about right and left being – meaning yeah. different. Okay. So um, in France – Macron isn't really left or right. He's actually more centrist, but he's globalist. He's globalist, uh, here we go. right? And Marine Le Pen and Mélenchon, who is the left party, she he was the left party. They are they are nationalist. That's right. Right. So in France, they, left right does not even apply. Okay. And you know, it, I mean, Trump is an example. Like Trump is a nationalist. Yes. You know, he's. He's not a Reagan conservative. He's not really free marketed at all, you know. Um, and you know, assuming he's running against Biden, Biden is, gosh, you know, I don't even know what you call him. He's but, hanging in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that that it's 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 a cultural phenomenon more than anything, rather than political. It's kind of what we're getting at. Yeah. It's it's a little bit of a broad way of putting it, but I struggle with this because I don't want to be. 
war machine hawk around the world, world's police, that whole deal. But I also have tremendous fears about, especially in our interconnected world now, countries falling in, including us, to isolationism, right? Because that's not really feasible. Everything's connected. Mm -hmm. Multinational corporations are everywhere. Like it or not, that's how it is. Yet the movements seem to be, okay, you want to remove left and right and make it more global versus nationalist. Well, that's what it is. They're either hard one way or hard the other. How do we... Can we change that? Um, there's a you know who Frederick Bastiat is. You ever hear him? He was a French economist, uh, 18th so. century. He was a libertarian economist. He had a quote that said, "If goods don't cross borders, armies will." Mm. Yeah. So w- here's another one for you. That's a good. We quote. have we have never been at war with a country with a McDonald's. Really? Yeah. We have never been at war with a country with a McDonald's. Wow. <laughs> so the That's point is, so we are not at war with China. China is still a big trading yeah. partner. That is a good thing. That is a good thing. So a lot of people, like, I, I piss off a lot of nationalists yeah. because I am really a very strong free trader. The more we trade with the outside world, the less likely it is we will have military conflict. And the fact that we still have China as a trading partner means it's very difficult for us to get into a war with them, which is a good thing. So if you're worried about, you know, Team America, World Police, like, you know, like that, what you should really be rooting for is us to be trading a lot with the outside world. So I see, I agree with you. I don't think, but. Now people want to say, oh, so you're valuing how another country does above us. No, I think that's how you you keep friends. I think that's how you how you innovate as well. We see all this all this jockeying for position that now changes, you know, things that we should be aligned on. As an example, countries should have some sort of alignment on, well, how are we approaching artificial intelligence? You don't do that being isolationist. You know, so I, I don't I don't really know the answer there, but I do know that there are people who have been left behind in globalism through things like the why is the name getting away from me right now? NAFTA and some and 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 some of the some of the trade agreements that have basically canceled out full industries. Well I can tell you how that happened. I mean basically it did away with middle class wages in the United States. Yes. Right? Because we during the period of globalism in the 2000s like take china as an example we said wow like chinese workers don't get paid very much we can manufacture very cheaply in china and we took the manufacturing here we moved it over to china and people who made 40 50 60,000 a year suddenly don't have a job right? right that's that's what happened so it the people like trump they look at that and they said well this is globalism was the worst thing in the world but what what did we get as a benefit very cheap goods, very cheap goods. Nobody was talking about inflation in the 2000s. I'll tell you a story. Um, this is when I moved to South Carolina, 2010. Um, I went to Walmart. And I was in Walmart, and there was a stack of do- – we had to buy a doormat for the new house. I had to buy a doormat, and there was a stack of doormats. And I lifted up a doormat, and I looked at the price, and it was $4, $4 for a doormat. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, all right, it's like rubber, and it's got AstroTurf on it. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, all right, this was made in China. So the raw materials and the labor and the AstroTurf and the rubber, and it was shipped all the way across the country, and I'm buying it for $4, and somebody's going to make a profit on it? I'm like, that's insanity. That's globalism, right? We can get goods for very cheap. I pulled up the same doormat on Walmart like six months ago, $45. What does that tell you? We're, we're probably making it in the U.S., you know? So it, inflation is uh, was a function of the stimulus. It's a function of the Fed, but it's also a function of trade, right? If we have free trade, it brings, it brings prices down. You also run into what goes into that, though. And, I, you know, 
I obviously don't think about it either. You see your phone sitting right there. I see Alessi's phone sitting right there. I got my phone sitting right here. There's slave labor that went into it. Slave labor in China, slave labor in the cobalt mines in Africa to get, I forget what, what hardware in there does that. But is that just, if I want to cancel out stuff like that, am I just being a utilitarian in your book? So utilitarian. In, in when critics of capitalism often talk about exploitation, right? That through global trade, we're exploiting workers who make less money around the world. Right. Well, usually what happens is, you know, the, the workers that made those doormats in China were probably getting paid 50 cents an hour. Now they're getting paid $10 an hour. The GDP of China, per capita GDP, has gone from about 4000 to 20000 over the last 10 or 20 years. Right. So, yes, there is a period of time when workers are not making very much. And you can say, wow, we're exploiting them. We have these children in the cobalt mines and stuff like that. But if you continue to trade, their standards of living improve over time. And capitalism is the best solution for people living in poverty globally. Uh, Bono recently was talking about, he was talking to the New York Times. And you know, back in 2002, 2003, he was hooking up with Paul O'Neill, who was Treasury Secretary, and he was going around Africa, and he was trying to get Paul O'Neill to like give aid to Africa. And he said, you know what? He's like, I was wrong. Like, he's like, I thought redistribution was the solution to all the problems of poverty. He said, what it actually is is commerce. It's capitalism. And he says, when I go to Africa now, he says, what we want is trade with the United States. We want to do business. That is how we improve our standards of living. So, you know, I see these videos on Twitter too with these kids and, you know, mining for cobalt in the mud and stuff like that. And I don't I don't have the same reflex as a lot of people do where I say, you know, this is exploitation. We should they should it should be stopped because honestly, in absence of those jobs, what would there be? You know, what do you mean? With, they just wouldn't have jobs. Yeah. And they might be dead. No matter how dangerous and how fucked up the conditions are there, you're saying that those conditions and that fuck uppery is, <laughs> is a stepping stone, is a stepping stone to something that will be better. And unfortunately, and, and correct me if I'm mistaken you here, unfortunately, it's a very shitty stepping stone, but it's the only one they have. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to know more about the situation to give a really yeah, great argument against yeah. you, but that's that's fascinating. I mean, because and again, I I try not to because I I tend to have the bleeding heart with stuff. That's my first reaction to things. I I try not to let that overdo it. But I mean, something... th think of it this way: we traded for a decade with China, and their standards of living went up, and their wages went up, and we don't do a lot of manufacturing in China anymore because it got too expensive. Right. So where do we go? We went to Vietnam, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. Wages were lower there. And now we have manufacturing in those countries, and over time, their standards of living are going to come up. And then it'll have to go somewhere else. Yeah. So will th in that system, does there always have to be somewhere that's fucked up and has slave labor, basically? <laughs> Are you putting words in my mouth? <laughs> I am. I, I, actually, I am. I'm totally putting words. But is that how it is? Like, is that just it, in order? It's meaning it has to be a zero sum game. Somebody's got to be losing at all times for new people to win. It's definitely not a zero sum game. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. Somebody the kids in, in the mines win. They somebody in China gets paid fifty cents an hour to make a doormat. And we get a doormat for four dollars. Everybody wins. It's trade. Trade is a solution. But if it's like slave labor, how's that, yeah. how's that a win? <laughs> <laughs> they can't even buy lo mein soup. And, you, and you're like, yeah, but I got my doormat. You know what I mean? And, and I know if, if I had a solution on how to fix it, I, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I, I, I know. Like it's – you come with empty solutions. But this is – to me, when we have cycles like that happen – this is how, for example, something like an idea of communism can suddenly only, what, 35 years, 30 years after the Soviet Union fell and all these countries fell after what disaster communism was. That's how this fast we can have a comeback. Of I'll, communism I'll, put, I'll give you ways. another example. Okay. We make cars in Detroit, right? 
BMW, Toyota, a couple other car manufacturers, they look at Detroit and they're like, wages are too high. We're going to do it in Kentucky, Tennessee, South Carolina. You know, this wage arbitrage that, that manufacturers do happens all the time. It happens within countries. It happens internationally. Like, and that's how we get the best prices. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's what it, it's what's continually happened. What are you what are you looking at with, with the election coming up? I keep forgetting we are literally now in an election year, so this is not that far down the road. We're talking like eight, nine months, whatever it is. But what first of all, what do you think is gonna happen and what do you think the economic implications are either way? Well, I'll give you a take on the election that I don't think a lot of people are talking about. It's gonna come down to the third parties. Like RFK. RFK and also No Labels. Do you know about No Labels? Never heard of No Labels? I don't think so. You should pull it up. Yeah, let's pull up No Labels. Uh, no Labels is a group that was, they have a lot of money, um, that wants to run a centrist candidate in the 2024 election. And what they're thinking about is Larry Hogan, Joe Manchin, yeah. people like that. And, and they have said that if Trump is the Republican candidate, they will run a candidate in the 2024 election. So, And do you think that – do you have a way you lean of who that takes more votes from? Because I mean, the, the options question. are very that's, bad. That's the question. It's not really about Trump versus Biden. RFK is going to take away votes from Trump. You think so? Yes. No labels will take away votes from Biden. The election comes down to who gets the most votes out of those third parties. You're certain that it'll break that way for both of them? Mostly, yeah. Why do you think RFK will take more from Trump than Biden? Um, I don't have any empirical evidence. You know who David Stockman is? Name sounds familiar. Yeah, he's he used to work for Reagan. He's a very conservative commentator. He's got a newsletter. He's on Twitter. Um, he's pumping hard for RFK on Twitter and he's a conservative. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, he, RFK seems to attract conservatives. So yeah. And I mean, he was running as a Democrat and then ended up changing independent to independent. Yeah. And he just, you know, he was, he was the guy who was questioning vaccines for a long time before the COVID vaccine was around. And so obviously people have a lot of opinions about that. I mean, let me, let me put it this way. If the election were held today with no RFK and no no labels, Trump would win. So, t so today, Trump would win. We have 300 days until the election. A lot of, a lot of stuff's going to happen. Um, if you're asking me for a prediction, I don't have one because there's too many variables but I think it comes down to the third parties. There so. was a poll that came out very quietly. I want to say it was in October, October, November, somewhere in there. It's from Quinnipiac, which is like a decent polling service. Some of these polls you got to look out. But this one blew my mind. In a three-person race, Trump, Biden, RFK, they had RFK polling at 22%. Now, that seemed high. Nonetheless, there is a real thing that's happened over the past less than a year where I have had a certain profile of individual, and I'll tell you exactly what it is, young males, middle class, between 20 and 25, that I'm in conversation with, usually something related to the podcast or something, they want to help out or they're a fan, whatever, who without me bringing it up, will bring up RFK Jr. and talk about what an unbelievable candidate he is for president, which tells me, who, who are these kids? These are young voters, maybe some of the cool kids on the block, people who are looking forward in, in their country and, and what this could be. And, and I haven't been able to place all the politics of all these people. Maybe you could have done that better. But that I don't think he's going to win. But it goes to show you that our options right now are so bad that we have a guy who I think has a shot to percentage beat what Ross Perot did in 1992. And the forget this election, I don't think he'll win. But if he does that and, uh, and something like – I got to look more into this no labels thing. I'm behind the game on this. Something like this also pulls off points and, and switches away. 
do you think that this could be a moment where we finally see a, a real, actual crack in the foundation of the two-party system? Um, that's something that people like to predict. Um, kind of, it's one of those things that never happens. Right. Um, I, I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to say no. Um, I think that the thing with no labels is that they're positioning themselves, themselves as the sane people in the center. And I think if this were... 1992, 1996, they would have a realistic shot at winning. But in 2024, people don't want sane people. Right. We, we don't want sane people. Like, this, this is a real... Like, Larry Hogan was a Republican governor of Maryland, a blue state, lowered taxes, Maryland is boomed, did a great job. Hated Trump. Yeah. Like, Joe Manchin has been a very successful senator, Democrat from West Virginia. If you take this party... And stick them in 1996, like, they win. You yeah. know what I mean? Yes. Yes, and that's the thing. Like, Bill Clinton, not a great guy and whatever, and there were certainly some mistakes in that presidency. I'm not just talking about the blowjob. But, you know, he was a real moderate dude. <laughs> like, like whether you like it or not, he was like a really, really solid president. I have, some, I have, I have, I have a great stat for you. Um, 1996 election, Clinton versus Dole. Right, the Macarena election. Yeah, you ever seen that? Video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Dole was seventy-two, by the way. And yeah. people said he was too old. Um, but you know what? You know what the turnout was for that election? Forty-six percent. It was the lowest turnout election mm. in a long time. Um, this last election, Trump versus Biden in two thousand twenty. I don't remember the exact number, but it was like high sixties. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So what I hear from people all the time, usually liberals, is they, they say, vote, go out, vote, rock the vote, go vote. They had those fucking I voted stickers and they walk around, look at me, I voted. Voting's the best thing in the world. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't no. vote. It's, Stay home. <laughs> well, what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that the best times are when people are disengaged from politics. Right when mm. when when people don't care who's president doesn't matter Republican Democrat ah they're so close together anyway it doesn't make any difference I'm not going to vote and things are good 1996 is one of the best years ever you know and now everybody is very engaged in politics and you know people would say well that's a good thing it's civic engagement no it's terrible it's terrible everybody cares about politics and that's bad it's their that's god bad yeah yeah how can you change that though because social media is really what did that. Social media gave everyone a goddamn opinion. I think it started in 2008. I think it started when Obama was elected and you had the Tea Party and there was this, yes. you know, Obama was the Manchurian candidate and people got all freaked out and, <laughs> you know, so, um, but social media, I mean, obviously social media is super polarizing, so. Yeah, I, I that's what I'm saying. And I don't ever, I try to stay away from the words like new normal. I mean, that's that's a big problem in the stock market when you say, oh, this is our new normal. That's usually with your sentiment meter like sell or buy or whatever the opposite of it is. But I wonder when it comes to like sentiment on how we engage publicly, if because we've rung that bell, we can't really unring it and people – they're going to take out their frustrations online. And, and that's, and again, that's what the algorithm fuels. If I make a video saying, here's a breakdown on politics today, no one clicks it. If I make a video saying, Trump and Biden are going to crash the world, everybody clicks it. <laughs> right? We're in, maybe I have to come up with a better title than that, but you get the point. Like, we are so incentivized to extremism that. Even, even if politics is a circle and left becomes right and right becomes left, which I agree with you it still ends up focusing the cycles on the extremes themselves running against each other and the pendulum swings get bigger and bigger over yep. time, no? That's that's right. Mm. So what's what's the number one thing you're looking for in 2025 if it's still Biden? And what's the number one thing you're looking for in 2025 if it's still Trump or if it's going to be Trump? Well, I'm a – first of all, I don't vote at all. Never. Um, I voted – I think the last time I voted was 2004. Um, actually, why, why is that? It's, you're going to love this. So there are degrees of political participation. Okay. 
And voting is one of the least effective ways you can participate in politics, right? If you vote, if you vote in a national election, unless you live in Ohio, it doesn't really matter. Like there's really only 70,000 oh, votes right. yeah, that yeah, yeah, matter yeah. in the country. Like you're just voting to gratify your ego and you, like, it doesn't matter. Right. But beyond that, so let's start at the bottom. Okay. Um, posting a meme on Facebook a political meme, right? That actually has negative implications. You're just going to piss people off. You're not going to bring people to your cause. You're just going to push them farther away, right? Participating in a protest on the street. That's the same thing. Doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Voting doesn't do anything. Um, really what you have to do is do something that gets other people to vote. Okay. So maybe this podcast, right? Wait, maybe wait, what do you, you lost me now. No, maybe if may, let's pretend this podcast was all about Trump and we, we were like pro Trump the, in the entire podcast and we laid out all these reasons why you should vote for Trump. And, you know, a million people watch the podcast and they go out to vote for Trump. That is more effective than voting is getting other people to vote. So you can write an op ed for for like uh, The New York Times. You can write a letter to the editor you can become a radio host, you can become a YouTuber, you become a podcaster. These are all things to do to participate in politics that are much more effective than voting. I can tell you, I have influenced the votes of thousands of people, for sure, through my writing. I've influenced people's votes. I have more of an impact doing what I do as a writer than I do actually going out and voting, which doesn't matter. So to amend what you're saying, maybe, correct me if I'm stating you wrong, if you didn't do what you did, under your theory, you should be someone who votes. If you, if you can't do any of those things, then yes, then you should vote. That's so interesting. That's <laughs> fucking loaded. I've never heard that one before. Yeah. I mean, I vote, when I go in, I vote for none of the above. I write in none of the above. Someone actually on this podcast gave me that idea because I was at a point where I wasn't voting. And they gave me a – I don't want to say like a sob story. They gave me a very legit story that really struck me about when they were serving in Iraq and the people voted for the first time and all that and how they – how they, they're like, look, just do it. You know, like it's it's not for this, not for the sticker, not for that, but because it, it's it's a part of the process, and there's people who would kill for that around the world, and I hear that. I just wish we actually had like good choices, but that what you're talking about is like a you you uh, I can't think of the right words, but like on one end, I want to say like utility versus replacement, something like that. Mm -hmm. Like you are because of what you do your vote is replaceable but because of other what people don't do their vote matters i'm kind of stating that a little wrong but you know you could also run for political office that's the ultimate in political participation yeah yeah but who the fuck wants to do that <laughs> like i look at people running i'm like all right what's wrong with you well you know what it comes down to it comes down to skin in the game right if you vote you have no skin in the game what like what? Whatever the outcome is, it it's it doesn't matter to you. You don't care. I mean, you voted, but there's no. Let me put it this way: there's no consequences if you are wrong, right? If you if you are there's no consequences person. if you're wrong, and then someone's like a bad governor or something. Very remote consequences. What I'm saying is, if you're if you're a media person, if you're writing or if you're on TV or whatever, and you're making statements, you're accountable to those statements. You have skin in the game. Or if you're a politician, you have skin in the game. But just voting, you have very little skin in the game. Hmm. I'm going to be thinking on this one for a while. <laughs> You're blowing my mind with some things. I don't know if I agree with all I actually of it, wrote a substack. I wrote a substack called You Don't Have to Vote. And can, we'll put the link to your substack down in the description as sure. well. So we'll have the link to your books in my Amazon store. You can go get Jared's books. But you also, I haven't read this. You wrote a novel in there, All the Evil yeah. in This World. Yeah. Because you're, you're an unbelievable writer. Like, I really enjoyed your style and Street Freak. And then when I was subscribed to a Daily Dirt app, I can read it very easily. So highly recommend. But what, what, what made you want to write fiction? I can tell you that it was the hardest thing I've ever written. So let me put this in perspective. Street Freak was 135,000 words. I wrote it in eight months. Okay. Your All, memoir, basically. Yep. 
All the Evil of This World was 70,000 words, and it took me five years. It was very, very hard. I also picked a, the novel with the highest degree of difficulty. It was extremely hard. What do you mean by that? Well, it's basically seven people that are sh seven short stories that are all interconnected with each other. So there's kind of a lot of engineering that goes in the book as to like, uh, you know, so it's it was really complex. It was very hard. Making so. them fit. Like I got to tell you, that is, it is the filthiest book in the world. Like, yeah, you were saying, what do you mean by that? I mean, you're going to have to check it out. I'll say, actually, I'll buy you a copy. I'll buy you a copy. I'll, 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 I'll send it I'll get it, it right you. when you leave. I'm not worried about it. I'll, I'll go get it. But what, what do you, what, when you say feel, like like people are fucking the whole time? Like uh, what? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you, you got something going on in your head there, some excitement. What was it? Did people do that on, on your Wall Street? Were people doing coke at the desk and fucking in the bathroom? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, actually, there was never there was never coke at the desk, but there was an instance where two people went to the Starbucks across the street and went in the bathroom. In the Starbucks. In the Starbucks. On Forty Second. Yeah. yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, that's a raunchy bathroom. <laughs> Even today. <laughs> Even. Oh no. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, because when people when people talk about Wall Street, though, like like I said, there's so many different ends of it. So people monolith the whole culture, but. There are some real cultures that are like fast and loose for sure. You were closer to that than I was, I'm sure. Yeah. But anyway, your book, No Worries, will be out when this is coming out. The yep. link is in the description in my Amazon store. Go check it out. I will put your other books in there as well. Street Freak, I cannot recommend enough. It's fucking phenomenal. I have to check out all the evil in this world. And then you wrote a collection of essays too. Those well, Bastards. Those Bastards. Yep. That was from last year. Yep. I'll put that in as well. But I really appreciate all your thoughts on breaking things down. I really enjoy your your behavioral finance, your sentiment outlook towards stuff. It, it, it's good stuff. I highly recommend your Twitter as well. So we'll put that down in the description. And thanks for finally being able to get up to New York and, and do this. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it was like a year before I finally got my ass out here. But Well, see, we, we made a seafood tower clip that <laughs> I obsessed over to get right. And look what happens. You see that? This kid made a fucking awesome clip over here. So... Anyway, Jared, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace. Thank you for watching this episode, guys. If you haven't already, please smash that subscribe button and hit that like button on the video. It is a huge, huge help to getting our videos into the algorithm on YouTube. So thank you to everyone who does that. And also, if you don't already follow me on Instagram, you can get me at Julian Dory Podcast for daily exclusive clips that we put out from the show or on my personal page at Julian D. Dory. The links are in the description below. See you guys for the next one.